Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the um, Committee of the Whole for Monday, June 19th. Um, I'd like to um, acknowledge that the land in which we gather is the traditional territory of the Coast and Strait Salish peoples. Specifically, we recognize the Lekwungen peoples known today as the Songhees and Esquimalt nations, and that the historic connections to these lands continue to this day. Um, some of you may be wondering why I am sitting in this chair and the mayor is sitting on, in my chair. Um, this is uh, the start of a process that the mayor has implemented where um, each councillor will get a chance to become uh, the chair of the Committee of the Whole meetings, and uh, we will get about a three month stint to do that in and so each of us will get some experience um, running the meetings and so the chair the, the mayor has very kindly agreed to sit in whoever's chair is um, is chairing the meeting and uh, he will act as a just a regular member of council um, but I will be um, looking at him if I run into issues so please and thank you um, we do have a very oh I, I'll go first to the approval of the agenda so move uh, can I have an approve move approval so C Councillor Green and second the mayor uh, any uh, op um, errors or omissions seeing none I'll call the question all in favor any opposed? None opposed? Motion carries. Um, I will note that we do have a very crowded agenda tonight, um, and uh, we're, we have a couple of delegations that we'll be presenting as well. So we do have a crowded agenda with some um, lengthy reports, and uh, we have an expectation that everyone will stay really focused on the on the conversation, um, and because we'll be very cog cognizant of the time, as we only have three hours to run our meeting. Uh, with that being said, um, we do have a delegation, two delegations tonight. The first one will be the Chatham District Girl Guides, uh, Jill Inget and Caitlin Davies, District Commissioner Team, um, will be coming up and doing a five-minute presentation. So ladies, if you'd like to come up to the table and have, have staff got your presentation? Yes? Okay, perfect. So I will start um, a, a timer for you, and I will give you about a... hopefully wrap up your comments and I'll hand it over to you thank you no problem are you able to hear me is it on mute okay all right does that work okay uh, so my name is Jill Ingett and this is Caitlin Davies and we're pleased to be here tonight and we're actually here on behalf of Chatham District Girl Guides Carnival and Ball Association uh, and the fifth Gary Oak Scouts and so Riley will turn to the next slide kindly uh, so just wanted to uh, come here tonight, um, now that sort of we're into a post-pandemic world, uh, we're re-emerging from our cocoons, uh, coming back out to do things, and so we wanted to talk to the council as a whole tonight uh, about different pieces, um, service projects, community presence, um, a little bit about parking lot safety around Firefighters Park and Boker Hall, uh, and then the future of those two areas as well. Riley, would you go ahead? Thank you. Uh, so I have a few slides just on each organization. Uh, we'll be brief on these. Uh, so for Carnivore and Ball Club, they occupy the two fields, the upper and lower fields at Firefighters Park. Um, they are between 80% uh, occupied or full occupancy between April and July. So that's their big season. They do have a fall ball season as well. Uh, and they have about 200 members um, split between the two and 40 coaches. And so this is a bit of information that they slide, Riley. Uh, for ourselves, uh, we have between 200 and 250 members um, who work between September and June every year. Um, we go from age five, so kindergarten age, all the way through to adult. Uh, the bulk of our members are between five and 17. So we go through kindergarten all the way through grade 12. Uh, we have about 10 to 12 different units. Um, this year we have uh, a, an outdoor travel unit um, or outdoor adventure unit. We have a travel unit uh, and we have an adult, uh, the Trefoil Guild, which is those who don't want to be around the littles all that often. <laughs> um, we use our facility year round though because our um, Girl Guides of Canada uh, rents out our space for week long rentals through the summer and over weekends. So we have uh, groups coming in from Alberta, Ontario, um, the lower mainland, um, and from all over to come and experience Victoria and Oak Bay. So that's a little bit about us. Next one, Riley. And from Scouts Canada, they have between 80 to 100 youth members. They operate their hall roughly the same uh, period of time that we do, so September to June. Um, they again go from 5 to 19, different levels, um, different stages, and some of you may have participated in them as well as guides. 
Um, they have about 30 adult volunteers above and beyond their membership. Uh, and again, they use their facilities year round, mostly weeknights. And so um, I think all of us are present when the daytime workers are not. So if you go to the next slide, Riley, please. Um, so we just wanted to come here tonight uh, on behalf of the three organizations to initiate a conversation on a few different areas. Um, so the first is service projects. So both guides and scouts have a service um, project component to our program areas, particularly for the older, um, so about 9 to 12 and to 17. And so if there are opportunities to partner with the municipality on some service projects, I know our, we've done some work around Boker Creek, um, and so if there's, there's work that is of interest um, that we could partner on, that would be great and we'd be open to having um, conversations about that. Uh, we also want to talk about com um, some community presence because we are becoming more present in the community. We participated in the Oak Bay Tea Party Parade. We actually had 60 girls come out and they had a great time. So uh, it's the start of our reemergence, and uh, we want to talk about what that could look like. So, you know, we sell cookies, you know, the scouts sell apples. Um, you know, if there's opportunities for us to, to come to different places or festivals or areas to, to, you know, engage with community, we'd love to do that. Um, we'd also like to talk about, and not just have to be tonight, but parking lot safety. Um, we've got uh, between the traffic between the two or, or three organizations, depending on how many are meeting any given night, plus the municipal vehicles and the fire trucks, things are getting a little hazardous at times. And so we're, hope, we're open to suggestions around what we can do or how we can all work together to improve that because um, while some of the older children are mindful, some of the five-year-olds just race out and we just don't want to see any accidents or unfortunate incidents. Uh, and the last part is um, we want to have a direct conversation with all of you around the future of Firefighters Park in Boker Hall. Um, we have been there since 1949 in the halls um, and First Victoria Guides, which I belong to, uh, is actually celebrating its 110th anniversary in two years in Victoria and Oak Bay. Um, so we have a long history here and we've all heard a little bit of rumor and speculation about Firefighters Park and Boker Halls and may or may not be there. Um, and we just wanted to have a direct conversation with all of you so that we can avoid the rumor and the speculation and, and just work together to whatever end um, is best for everyone. Thank you so much. You finished at five minutes and 13 seconds. I did not give you a 30-second warning. Look, you did very, very well. <laughs> Thank you. Um, does anyone have any questions that they would like to direct to either Ms. Ingot or Ms. Davies? Yeah, not at this time, but thank you very much for bringing this forward. Um, this will be something that we can um, have a future conversation around as well. Um, so thank you for bringing it to our attention, and thank you for your presentation. Great. Thank, thank you all you. for having us. Thank you. Uh, the next um, delegation is on zero carbon step code, and I'd like to invite um, Ms. Andrea Careless to the, to the um, podium or to the table. And um, you will have the same five minutes, Ms. Careless, and I'll try and remember to jump in and give you the 30 seconds. <laughs> thank you. Yep. Can you use your Can you use your um, your microphone? Uh, I will give you some leeway on that, but there won't be a ton of leeway because we are we do have a lot of, of things okay. to cover tonight. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Good evening, Mayor and Council. This is a summary of the zero carbon step code which the Oak Bay Climate Force is hoping Oak Bay will implement. Next slide, please. In 2007, Oak Bay set a target of reducing our greenhouse gas emissions by 33% from 2007 levels. However, in 2020, our overall emissions had decreased by only 15.5%. The zero carbon step code provides an effective way to reduce emissions from new buildings and avoid costly res retrofits in the future. Next slide, please. In buildings, fossil fuels used for, are used um, for space and water heating mostly, and they cause most of the greenhouse gas emissions. And the thing is, we have ample low carbon alternatives for natural gas, induction stoves, electric water heaters, and especially heat pumps, which not only heat homes, but also create cooling for increasingly hotter summers. Next slide, please. Before we get to the zero carbon step code, let's take a look at the BC Energy step code. This code helps to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by making buildings more energy efficient. However, it allows any kind of energy, even if it's a high source of greenhouse gases. Next slide, please. 
So let's take a look at greenhouse gas emissions by fuel type. This chart is about part nine buildings, but natural gas emissions from part three buildings in Oak Bay have increased much, much more. Step three is intended to increase energy efficiency by 20%. However, natural gas emissions are still very high, as you can see. Next slide, please. The BC zero carbon step code is based on, oop, sorry, I, I missed one. Can you go back um, to, sorry, to slide, um, go back to the next one. Oh, no, sorry. Keep going the other way. Forward and forward and forward. Sorry about that. The zero carbon step code requires that by 2030, the energy used in all new buildings will be zero carbon. Um, the code requires that all new buildings be zero carbon by 2030 for the province. And um, used together, the two codes support both energy efficiency and zero carbon energy. Next slide, please. So getting into the BC zero carbon step code, it's based on zero carbon levels that increase in stringency similar to the energy step code. The code increases climate performance by three levels, moderate carbon performance, so space heating has to be zero carbon, strong carbon performance, so space and water heating systems have to be zero carbon, and zero carbon performance, so no fossil fuels are allowed, full electrification. There's also a measure only option and this is measuring a building's emissions without reductions and is intended to build knowledge. Next slide, please. In 2022, after reaching out to all its members, the CRD converged, convened Victoria, Saanich, and Central Saanich to run a consultation on low carbon standards for buildings. The building industry played a major role. The general response was the zero carbon step code is an effective and practical way for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. There was also a call for a consistent regional policy to provide certainty for industry. Next slide, please. After the consultation, Victoria and Saanich voted unanimously this spring to implement the code with identical approaches. They will require zero carbon performance in all new buildings by November 2024. That's six years ahead of the BC target. Central Saanich has approved adopting the code on the accelerated timeline for part nine buildings. They're waiting for staff analysis before deciding on part three buildings. V View Royal Council has referred the issue to staff and Meanwhile, Colwood and the Highlands have already passed a low carbon energy system bylaw that came out before the zero carbon step code, so they may well adopt the code. Next slide, please. So, Oak Bay staff will soon be considering how to implement recommendation four of the Community Climate Action Working Group. This includes creating policies to accelerate energy and greenhouse gas reductions in new buildings. The Oak Bay Climate Force urges you to adopt the zero carbon step code with the accelerated timelines. We absolutely have to get fossil fuels out of buildings as a key way to meet our climate targets. Next slide, please. So what kind of world will we leave for our children and generations to come? Every decision we make in Oak Bay matters. As UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said, humanity is on thin ice, and that ice is melting fast. Our world needs climate action on all fronts, everything, everywhere, all at once. Thank you. Thank you. I was just going to say, I just was added a little bit of time for you because oh. of the, the little couple yeah. that you had. So so you did a perfect timing. Great. Thank you. Thank um, you. I, I, I just have one quick question. Would you make that um, your your um, words and the uh, slideshow available to us at council? Because yeah. I, for one, would like to, to read it. It's, it's in our agenda now. Thank okay. you. Thank you. So I'm it's in the, I will make the, the script from the yes, slideshow available as that would be lovely. Well. Thank you. And I wanted to add, I have, to, I have sources that I've provided you. I have one more to add. Okay. And that's it. Um, and does anyone have any, before you jump up, does anyone have any questions? Yes, uh, Councillor Patterson. I, I, I already fit the criteria, I think, because I, the only fossil fuels I use in my home are the ones that are needed to produce the electricity. But I, I know that there is certainly a strong desire to move in the direction, which I support. But I, I have not yet seen the information from, uh, from BC Hydro to um, really 
engage in the conversation about if the if we accelerate this trend to electrify all of these things and get a move away from fossil fuels, um, what is the capacity within yeah. the BC hydro grid? And, um, you know, what are they expecting? So I unfortunately keep missing presentations on that. And I just wonder if you also have any information yeah, on that. I can pass it on to you. Thanks, if you could make it available to all of council, yeah, that would be I wonderful. Will. Okay, and uh, uh, one more question, uh, Councillor Smart. Uh, thank you. Um, through you, Acting Mayor, uh, just wondering if there was any discussion that you're aware of around um, zero carbon and, and retrofits and existing buildings at all? No, not that I'm aware of, but it should be. <laughs> no, I can't say anything about that. I'll look into it. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for coming in and presenting. That was okay. wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now what we're going to do is I'm going to give the, um, we're going to be going on to mayor and council verbal reports, but I will give the number uh, for, for you to call if you are looking to do public comment and uh, for our question period. Um, and that number will be 1-855-703-8985. That's 1-855-703-8985. Um, just so that you're prepared after our mayor and council verbal reports uh, that you can call in. So I will go, um, I think I started on the left last time. I'm going to start on the right this time. Councillor Green, if you would like to go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, I don't really have a lot to report. I've been on holiday for the last 10 days, but I was pleased that Councillor Patterson, in my absence, was able to attend the Regional Water Supply Commission's tour of the watershed. So she attended on uh, my behalf and therefore on Council's behalf, and I'm sure she would be, ho ho I'll put words in your mouth, maybe you'd share some of that experience with, with our Council. Thank you. Thank you so much. And next I'll go to Councillor Watson. Thank you, Acting Mayor. Uh, very quickly, I have, uh, since my last report, attended a couple of different meetings for the South Island Prosperity Partnership. One was the um, Municipal Partners Day, where we were able to review a uh, first draft of a terms of reference for that working group. Um, and also, I got myself uh, appointed to be part of a planning group for uh, the Local Government Leadership Day, which will take place in November. Then there was their AGM last week out at the Mary Winspear uh, Centre in um, Sydney. That was a well-attended event where, the, of course, the um, uh, board was brought in for the next year and also where um, Professor Suzanne Thiessen was appointed as the liaison to the um, uh, uh, liaison from the uh, Indigenous Prosperity Centre Advisory uh, Board to, uh, to South Island Prosperity Partnership. So that was uh, um, important news. Um, I was also very pleased to attend an, a, a fun uh, and important community event, which th was the induction of the a new rector, Alan Dirksen, at St. Philip Church, uh, an important new servant leader in our community. So that was a, a very special day for them and the community more broadly. And finally, this is kind of more local, local, but I also attended a um, uh, kind of the first meeting of a new block watch group in my own neighborhood and I was pleased to have two police uh, representatives there uh, telling us all about our you know what's what and responsibilities and and uh, the kinds of um, things that we can do to ensure safety and sort of community building in our own local area so that was really a lovely highlight and there were about 60 people in the living room of, in my neighbor's lovely home uh, for this to take place so it was really it was really good it felt like a very strong um, uh, uh, gathering and uh, you know, lots of, um, you know, a sense of uh, neighborliness uh, amongst us all. So that's my report. Thanks, Councillor Watson. I think that Oak Bay actually has the most block watch block watches in, in on the whole CRD. So there you go. Um, and now it was remiss of me to not mention that Councillor Appleton is uh, coming to us from Zoom. So Councillor Appleton, I would like to go to you next, if that's all right. Thanks very much, Acting Mayor. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Excellent. Great. So thanks very much for offering me the opportunity to give an update here remotely. Um, I will just say that it's been a busy week or a busy month uh, as chair of the Greater Victoria Public Library branch or board, excuse me, the reopening of the Oak Bay branch has been just a big success in this last past month. And I just wanted to say thanks to the mayor and the mayor members of council that were uh, there for the reopening event. Uh, and uh, there were mem members of the public raring to go and get in the door uh, as soon as it was open. And it was just a really positive thing. I want to thank again, GVPL staff and, and Oak Bay staff 
for all the hard work that they did uh, to get that open, especially Mr. Graham um, on our facility side, uh, who, who just did uh, you know extraordinary work to to support the GPPL and getting that back open. So I couldn't be more pleased that that's back open. I also toured um, in my capacity as chair and with a couple of staff members present, we toured MLA Murray Rankin around the reopened branch uh, just to show him what was, what was new there. Um, and he was very, very pleased to, to see what was going on. I'm very pleased to uh, see everybody back in the branch. So it's exciting times. Um, and I'm just very pleased this last past, the weekend before this last past one on the 10th to uh, participate with Vice Chair Shahira Kerr. We did the uh, the Booking It Bike Tour to all 12 branches in one day. Um, so what started off as a sort of interesting idea of mine became this really great opportunity to showcase all 12 branches in the GVPL system all the way from Central Sandwich on down and opportunity so uh, we're very, very extremely proud of that and um, that got some media pickup as well so we're really pleased uh, to promote and showcase the work that staff are doing in branches um, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention the Heritage Foundation as well. We met on Tuesday the 13th, lots on the go with the Heritage Foundation. I will, uh, now that the summer night markets are on, uh, if council and members of the public are interested in finding out more about the foundation, of course, they uh, have a booth, a well-attended uh, educational opportunity at the Open Night Market. So please come and uh, check that out. Thank you very much, acting there. Thanks so much for the update. Uh, and it was a great opening for the library, so thank you. Uh, Mayor Murdoch. Uh, thank you, Chair. And I get a chance to do updates every week, so I don't have uh, to go over too, too much. But a couple of things just worth I wanted to point out. One, uh, uh, I arranged to have our Tommy Douglas slash Tommy Shoyama desk refinished, so you'll see it's all shiny and new here. So this is the desk that sat in Tommy Douglas's constituency office for many years in Saskatchewan, went with him to Ottawa. Uh, was used by Tommy Shoyama to draft up the Canadian Health Act, uh, and then brought it out here to pot plants when he moved to Oak Bay. <laughs> and uh, it was generously donated from the from his family and pre prior gardener, and um, and so, but it was in a bit of rough shape. So it's all back in here now, shining and new, and we'll have some wheels on it to move it around a bit more efficiently. But uh, nice to have that back and looking good. And that was to pot plants, not to pot plants. To, yes. <laughs> yes, to put dirt and plants into pots. Yes. Thank you for the clarification. Um, I also had a chance to uh, to tour the uh, engineered landfill uh, with, with the CRD and the and solid waste plan. Uh, if you ever, anybody has a chance to do that, it sounds perhaps a little disgusting, but quite interesting. Um, amazing amount of work to capture, not just from uh, the current and, and upcoming phases, but all of the the entire history of the landfill in terms of capturing all of the. Uh, methane and off-gassing um, and how that's being used and being sold back as renewable natural gas uh, through that process and uh, all of the uh, biosolids treatment and so forth from the sewage treatment is all out there uh, and then of course the massive amount of work to, to prepare phases three through six in terms of coring out a new space for to last us for the next hundred years so um, quite a fascinating tour it's available to the public occasionally and so if you have a chance to do it I would recommend um, there's also just a little update. There's a transit, um, BC Transit conference going on this week, which I'm uh, periodically attending as a member of the v uh, Regional Transit Commission Board. But uh, our last uh, meeting happened last week, so a little bit of updates. Mm -hmm. One, um, there is trials happening right now. So um, we're, BC Transit is transitioning to an electronic fare system to allow you to use your phone to just tap and you go on and, uh, and track that so you don't have to kind of manage cash or do anything else on that, which is, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, so that's being trialed right now in Greater Victoria, so if you have a chance to use it, I would uh, highly recommend. Um, ridership right now is creeping up about 90% or more of uh, pre-pandemic levels, so we're, the transit system is back, largely back in, in where it was pre-pandemic, and so now uh, thought going to, uh, to, to growth and managing that. Um, uh, they will be contemplating fares. Fares haven't increased for close to 10 years on the system. And um, so they'll be doing a fair review that'll be coming for whatever that decision happens will be coming uh, likely in next summer. Uh, will be any, any fair changes as they determined. Uh, also some consideration of perhaps looking at the gas tax. There's a, there's a small, relatively small levy on a per liter basis in Greater Victoria for funding transit. So uh, that may be up for, for consideration as well. 
Um, and last but not least, there's a lot of work happening there. The, the decision made at the last meeting was to uh, pre-fund essentially a lot of the rapid transit stations out to the West Shore to help facilitate. Um, that's had a tremendous uptake, uh, jumped by 20% ridership already. Um, and so with that rapid bus, um, they just need the infrastructure now to kind of support people standing uh, out and waiting for those buses. So uh, all of that's moving forward at high speed as well. That's my update. Thank you very much, Mayor. Uh, and next we'll go to Councillor Smart. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I've been very busy attending many amazing uh, music and dance concerts at Oak Bay High and Lansdowne Middle School, as many parents are right now. Um, I also enjoy participating in the Tea Party and Tea Party uh, Parade um, with Council. Um, and I was very grateful to attend both the launch of the South Island Indigenous uh, Business Directory and the Floatum event in the Inner Harbour, two great events that uh, really talked about the Indigenous uh, economy and the Floatum event gathered um, Island First Nations marine response vessels and crew to celebrate the stewardship of our oceans and economic prosperity. The Heritage Commission webinar this month was on Indigenous heritage and highlighted a successful, munici successful municipal engagement process in Fernie and the main takeaway from the webinar was working together rather than asking for Indigenous consultation. I also attended the CRD Climate Action Steering Committee, which had presentations around regional transportation planning and discussions on educating the community on climate action. Um, Oak Bay Night Market, always a fantastic event. Uh, and I participated in the City of Victoria's Ideas Jam for transforming the Rock Bay neighborhood into an arts, design and industry district. And I was also um, grateful to speak on a panel for the South Island Prosperity Partnership podcast series about 15 minute cities. Thanks, that's everything. Thanks very much. And last but not least, Councillor Patterson. Thank you. And yes, it has been a bit of a busy month. We're into the community activities, which definitely add to the schedule. And June 1st, um, I attended the first night walk that set off from the marina to Anderson Hill. We were a little too early, though, so we didn't see really the, the sunset and the moon rise. We would have had to stay out longer, so <laughs> we didn't do that. And, of course, then the, the night market uh, on the 14th. So that was, um, that was great to get out back in the community, and slowly people are coming back after post-pandemic, and, and so it's nice to, to see familiar faces. Uh, June 6th, I attended the Oak Bay Emergency Preparedness Volunteer Dinner, um, and uh, that was great. It was held at the Monterey Center. I'm new to this as a liaison this term, and so it's, it's nice to be able to um, see faces and connect some names and faces. And they were, we were also giving recognition to many of the volunteers who were awarded recognition pins, ranging from five years to one of our ham radio operators received his 30-year recognition for service. Quite outstanding. Um, uh, along with the other members of council, attended the South Island Indigenous Prosperity Partnership at the Songhees Wellness Center had uh, quite a conversation with their cannabis production <laughs> group, so that was very interesting. Also, um, as mentioned by um, Councillor Watson, I attended the induction of Reverend uh, Dirksen at St. Philip's Anglican Church. I, I just, um, it's very nice to have the new pastor, but I also would like to give some recognition to the outgoing pastor, Christopher Page, who is very beloved by the congregation and with over 30 years of service with one congregation, that's that's got to be definitely a record of service for congregations now. And so I hope he is able to enjoy a well-deserved retirement. Uh, June 9th, I did also, along with uh, the mayor and Councillor Smart, attend the First Nations Marine Stewardship Flotilla. And it was uh, very nice to attend because this, these were the same um, groups of uh, people that I saw at the, um, uh, the simulation of the emergency spill response. So I got to see them actually at that a month earlier. Um, really carrying out all of the activities that they would do 
uh, if there was a spill response in the harbor. So it was nice to be able to um, to speak with some of them and to learn about what they're doing. The it, the flotilla was to celebrate Indigenous marine stewardship, and this group has a strategic. Um, of four pathways, protect and restore, strengthen authority and jurisdiction, revitalize cultural connections, and encourage economic prosperity. They right now have 22 vessels in the program um, and have 62 employees engaged in conducting the exercises. And while they were not all at the harbor uh, on that day, they did have several vessels out there and the um, representing uh, the Esquimalt Harbor and West Victoria waterways. We had Songhees and Esquimalt nations. For the Saanich Peninsula, the Sayut and Sakum First Nations, Brentwood Bay, uh, the Sartlip, uh, North Saanich Peninsula, the Pakwachin, and then the Malahat Nation for the West Shore Saanich Inlet, Shianu for East Souk, and of course Souk. Uh, nation also. So it was nice to see them all gathered uh, with their crews and the recognition they were given. June 13th, I attended the Victoria Family Court and Youth Justice Committee reception for um, the bringing together again of the regional resource agencies that the committee works with and who the resource agencies all work with youths and families um, in the in, within the CRD, and we had uh, representatives from 15 agencies present and about 22 representatives, including our own Deputy Chief um, Julie Channon. It was nice to see her out there, and obviously she has a very good relationship with a lot of the people on the West Shore um, and has worked a lot with youth throughout the CRD region. And then, as um, Councillor Green said on June 16th, I joined the Juan de Fuca Saanich Peninsula and CRD Water Commission tour of the Souk Lake Reservoir and water treatment facilities. Some of it I had seen before, but it's always nice to, to see what they're updating. And I was quite interested in, and hopefully I will not uh, botch the saying of this, but the, the portable potables. <laughs> um, Equipment that they have, and it was very interesting because they do have um, they do have specialty vans now, so that if uh, the water supply is interrupted in an area, the vans can go out, can connect to um, uh, the fire hydrants, and put the water through the vans and provide potable water in emergency or any situation that comes up. And so the portables were actually designed so that they could be either purchased by communities or dropped off in communities and provide um, uh, a smaller amount of water, but nevertheless, potable water in an emergency situation. So that certainly came to mind with all of the capital projects that we have to do that it might be a, a good thing. So it's been a very busy month. So, and that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much, Councillor Patterson and Councillor Green. I see you have your hand up. And I apologize. There was life before my holiday, I just realized. So the week before we left, um, on June the 11th, I also attended the reopening of the library in Oak Bay, and that was a really happy event. I attended the Wellness Center, um, Songhees Wellness Center, for the SIPS Indigenous Business Directory launch and also attended the induction briefly of the new minister at St. Philip's, so my apologies. No worries, thank you. It's hard to remember sometimes after holiday. I will keep my um, comments uh, as brief as I can. Uh, I attended the, um, as the alternate director of the CRD, um, the building um, First Nations Relations um, afternoon that they had presentation, and also the GVLRA um, a presentation on responsibilities and labor awareness. And I had uh, a meeting with the RMTS, our, our board meeting, and we were welcoming some of the new members and talking a little bit about um, funding and what might be coming down the pipeline there. And then really the biggest um, report that I would have would be from the Parks, Rec and Culture. We did have our Parks, Rec and Culture meeting um, and we talked a little bit about, um, which will be coming back to Council, um, the public art po arts policy. Um, there was a final review of that. Uh, some locations for some permanent um, new pieces of art. Um, and um, 
a presentation around uh, the ecosystems, uh, protecting the ecosystems in Uplands Park and Cattle Point, which I, I think will be coming to Council again at another point in time as well. Um, some people have talked a little bit about the, the markets, which are now every second uh, Wednesday of the month, the night markets. Uh, I did attend the spring night nosh. I know the mayor was there as well on Saturday, uh, which was fabulous. It was really good, some really great food there. Um, and then I also was able to um, introduce the Lekwungen tr traditional dancers at the sharing dance event which happened at um, Henderson Park on Friday. Um, yoga in the Park starts on uh, July 4th. The summer concerts at Willow start on ju June 29th and the Arts Alive opening is on July 6th. So a lot of community events coming up and um, we look forward to seeing everybody out at, out, out at them. Uh, so that concludes our reports from Council uh, and we're going to move on to the public comment and question period. Uh, just a reminder, anybody who would like to phone in, the number is 1-855-703-8985. Uh, for those of you in the room, uh, if you um, would like to come up to the desk and re please remember that the um, the public participation period is meant for items that are not on the agenda um, and if you could state your name and your municipality and keep your remarks brief not to ex exceed three minutes that would be wonderful thank you and welcome may I begin yes uh, uh, thank you, um, uh, Acting uh, Chair. My name is Eric Zelga. I live in the north part of, uh, of Oak Bay. And um, uh, I, I don't wish to sort of stay at the meeting for, um, for hours and hours. Uh, I might accidentally touch on some items of the agenda later on, uh, but I'll do my best to uh, word it in such a way that I'll get away with it. <laughs> um, first of all, I want to say thank you very much for always beginning the meetings uh, with uh, um, the uh, tradition uh, from our First Nations. Uh, and part of their culture, which is to acknowledge the land. I appreciate that it's being added to our, uh, and, and, and being uh, added to our, our existing cultures, our existing um, uh, ways of uh, beginning meetings, and I very much appreciate that. Um, I notice also that our head of state is no, not on the wall yet, so allow me to say something that comes from my culture, God save the king. So allow me to begin then with my, com my, my, my notes. I, I wish to uh, say thank you um, uh, to the uh, uh, Girl Guides for bringing forward the concern around the parking lot area in the uh, uh, police, fire, uh, first um, uh, scout guides and baseball and parking area. Uh, and now it's also uh, a storage area for public works, I noticed. And uh, I, I'm, I'm uh, condolences again to staff for the terrible thing that happened just across the street. But that only serves to underscore the serious concerns in that area where we have mixed use of, uh, of cars flying in and flying out. God forbid we have an emergency uh, with the police needing to take off quickly with, uh, with children around. So I certainly do, do my best to encourage you uh, to um, maybe find a way to possibly set up some way of, of marshalling the children in such a way that they can get through all this mixed uh, use of these uh, very important lands. Um, I do note also the zero carbon step code. Uh, I, I sorry, um, uh, am very pleased to see that we have a carbon uh, uh, for, um, a group that, uh, th that is bringing forward this suggestion. I cannot support their suggestion to go to the, uh, to the, to the, the highest level of step code from a 20% reduction um, uh, theoretical to a 40% reduction in terms of any of the new houses. Um, when I look at uh, the drawdown.org list. If anyone uh, uh, was wondering what the IPP, uh, IPCC uh, scientists did between the UN, uh, between the UN reports that, that, that relating to that 1.5 and 2 degree uh, uh, concerns that they raised, they basically uh, helped to come up with a list of prioritized. 30 seconds. Oh, th oh, is it two minutes? It at at three minutes. It's 30 seconds, but I'll give you still 30 seconds from now. Oh, during uh, committee of the whole as well. So I could possibly leave and then come back for a, for a second, if there's no one else willing to speak. If I call for seconds, yes. Oh, that's good to know. I appreciate that. Um, so um, the the um, the aspect of a zero carbon emission housing uh, of the list of 100 items is approximately number 100. It's it's even ahead of bike lanes, which is also near the bottom. Um, refrigeration management and reducing food waste is up near the top, uh, and and of course solar. Uh, infill, uh, please uh, re re remember uh, that um, the largest cemetery, reputed cemetery in all of the, of the Victoria area, CRD area, is reputed to be in the uplands. Let's not repeat Oka. If anyone remembers the 1990 Oka crisis, God forbid 
that we um, need to have the government of Canada step and in and you. purchase that's, the lands as they did if, in Quebec. That's your time. Thank you so much. And uh, my final comments are affordability. When are you going to mention it in your programs? Thank you. Cheers. Thanks so much. Is there anyone else in the room who would like to come forward to speak? And just a reminder that it's on items that are not on the agenda coming up. Okay. Welcome. If you can just state your name and area of, um, of residence. Okay. My name is Karen Wallace Prince, and I live in Oak Bay. And right off the bat, I feel incredibly honored to be sitting at Tommy Shoyama and Tommy Douglas's desk. It's breathtaking, so thank you for having it renovated. Um, I'm here to speak about the continued closure of the Oak Bay Archives, Community Archives. I used to volunteer there um, for about over 10 years um, before the pandemic. Um, my questions, although I realize that this isn't a forum where we can have a discussion and have answers, is why the archives are still closed. We still don't have an answer to that. And when will they be opened again? In March, I had a one-on-one -on -one discussion with Mayor Kevin Murdoch. And in April, myself, along with 9 to 11 archives, met with uh, Director of Corporate Services, Chris Coates, and his assistant, Jessica um, Leslie Watson, Councillor Leslie Watson and the present archivist, Anna Sander. Um, we were told that they were working towards opening things up again, but could not promise when that would be. Another meeting was to be scheduled for us. It was in the offing, but we've had no communication from anyone since then. Um, the Oak Bay Community Archives is the only archives in the CRD that is not open to the public. The Oak Bay, um, the longer the community archives remains closed, the greater the risk, I fear, of lost connections, lost donations, lost opportunities for residents, students, researchers, and volunteers engaging actively and eagerly with our Oak Bay histories. Thank you. Thank you, um, Ms. Prince. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if we um, have any, any other information for you, uh, but um, that will be something that we'll take back to staff and have a discussion around. So thank you very much. Is there anyone else who would like to uh, present? We're, we're not really supposed to go for a second time. Um, so, and we do have a really full agenda tonight. Um, I will allow you two minutes this time uh, if you'd like to come back and speak. And I'm giving you a lot of leeway there. <laughs> Many thanks, uh, Acting uh, Mayor. Uh, my name is Eric Zelka from the northern part of Oak Bay. And I very much appreciate that Council is very open to public participation. This is uh, evidence of that. Thank you so much. I wanted to congratulate staff. Um, I've been waiting for the consolidated zoning bylaw that was just put up on the 1st of June. Finally, um, folks who are trying to build or do renovations, thank you, uh, uh, can see that uh, Airbnbs are outlawed in Oak Bay, since it's nowhere to be found on the website. We can finally see it in the zoning bylaw. Thank you so much for appreciate, appreciate that. Um, I uh, also wanted to uh, ask a question, if I may. Um, I know one of the uh, uh, intents, one of the desires, the values, is to create d diverse options and affordable housing. Where? in the um, secondary suites and the uh, housing uh, 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 initiatives that are uh, current today is the concept of, of affordability. Is, is it possible to ask that question? It wouldn't be answered right now, I don't think, but you can definitely, we'll definitely take that away. Oh, thank you. And the last thing I'll ask is, uh, is about cost. Um, park recs and culture, I would hope that you'll consider bringing back the commission, maybe at the time that you consider a marina commission, since we have the marina to deal with, the we, the royal we. Um, uh, uh, there is so much to be done, and if council doesn't have time, as you've noticed, there's too much, we either hire staff or we get volunteers. Hope Bay was so inexpensive for so many years because of our commissions that we were able to off offload things to. Please consider the bringing back the commissions. 
instead of just a committee. Thank, thank you so thank much, you and so I really much. appreciate this. Yeah, no worries. Thank you. And we have one more speaker. Please come up and uh, state your name and area of residence, Mr. Wallace. Can you just press the red, the little button? Thank you. Uh, my name is Bob Wallace. I live at 1584 Prospect Place inside the Heritage, Prospect Place Heritage area. You have all received, probably from several of us and others, concerns about blasting. Now, Mr. Wallace, we're actually going to be covering the blasting further on in the agenda. So if you're if you're there to speak about blasting, you'll have to wait until that. I thought it was the same agenda. in the same looked like the same. I apologize. Yeah, no worries. It won't take very long, I promise. Because now I probably hex that. We're going to move on now to um, the draft policies and regulations, which are subject to public input. Um, and we're going to start off with uh, with number 6.1, which is the draft surplus allocation policy. And we're going to have our director of finance and asset management, um, Director Payne, who I believe is online to present for us. Mr. Payne. Uh, thank you and good evening, uh, Chair. I just got a... Um very brief presentation, so I'm going to put that up on the screen and share with everyone. There we go. Okay, Council uh, may recall that uh, staff were uh, directed to prepare a surplus allocation policy for Council consideration um, just about this time last year. So we've put together something for consideration. Uh, in the agenda package, you'll see two attachments to the report. The first attachment is the marked up version of the report, of the uh, policy, pardon me. Um, and that just shows all the changes so that uh, Council could track the changes if they wanted to. And the second attachment is the uh, uh, proposed amended uh, policy without the marked up changes, uh, so a clean version of that. The first thing I wanted to do was just quickly define what we mean by surplus when we're talking about the policy and, and today, because often we um, uh, we accidentally in interchange budgetary surplus with accounting surplus, and they mean two significantly different things. An accounting surplus is, is essentially um, the difference between revenues and expenses. And we uh, use that accounting surplus to pay for capital expenditures, pay off debt, and to transfer funds to reserves. Those through three things, according to public sector accounting standards, are not considered expenditures. Really, capital expenditures are, are they're not considered expenses, pardon me. Um, capital expenditures are an addition to our assets. Uh, debt payments are a reduction of a liability and transfers to reserves are really just setting aside funds that we already have. So the difference between our accounting surplus and those items come to our budgetary surplus and pursuant to the community charter, we are um, required to budget for a zero dollar budgetary surplus. Now, if there's any changes to these figures throughout the year, we can produce a budgetary surplus and council has an option of what with to do that budgetary surplus. So here's just a quick example I put up there. In the left most, most column, you have a typical budget with a $0 budgetary surplus. Uh, assume for a second that your revenues um, were $1 million uh, in excess of what your budgeted revenues were, and that would give you an extra uh, million dollars. And in this example, your expenses are $500,000 less that would give you an additional uh, $500,000 producing um, an accounting surplus that exceeded what you had budgeted for. And assuming that uh, for in, in this example that your revenues, that extra million dollars in revenues was a restricted grant from the government. So they said, you have to set that aside in the reserves. So in this example, we've transferred it to reserve at the bottom here, less transfer to reserve. So that allows us to uh, produce a budgetary surplus of $500,000. And that's really leftover funds after all of that, that council has the choice to utilize however council wishes. Um, as an example, in, in our 2022 financial statements, we produced an $8.2 million accounting surplus, but that only translated to a $1.2 million budgetary surplus. So that's why I always begin by, by drawing the difference between those. And every year when we present the financial statements, I'll draw a line between our accounting surplus and a budgetary surplus, just so we can have that conversation um, transparently. So where do 
budgetary surpluses go. So unless they're set aside by council, um, they get directed to what's called our operating fund. And our operating fund is really just an unrestricted accumulation of budgetary surpluses. So they sit there until council uses them and they can be used uh, when I bring forward the budget and I recommend funding sources and I say, well, we've got this unrestricted fund. Do you want to use it for X, Y, Z? You say yes by passing your, your uh, budget bylaw. Another way is for council to allocate it annually, which is what this policy would direct staff to assist council to do. So until 2018, the CAO uh, typically would allocate the budgetary surpluses. Uh, but in 2022, council allocated all the budgetary surpluses that had accumulated between 2019 and 2021. That's basically when I had started at the district and um, we hadn't um, approached the budgetary surpluses and I was just uh, sort of clarifying the use of all of our reserves. And I brought forward a, um, a report to council in May of 2022 and um, uh, over $10 million of that was um, allocated at that time. And council said also bring forward a policy for us to consider. So what the new policy says, I've summarized in, in a couple bullet points here. First of all, it says council allocates budgetary surpluses. So that tells staff we can't restrict it uh, without first um, asking for council permission to do so. It also says water, sewer, and general budgetary surpluses, they stay in their respective fund. So if the water fund produces a surplus, then that stays in the water fund and is used for water expenditures. Um, it also provides greater transparency about the current reserves. So we have a little narrative about some of our reserves that wasn't in there previously and the previous versions of the policy. We also put a chart in the back uh, that kind of, uh, it's a hier hierarchical uh, chart that shows how all of our, our reserve funds are structured and what they're used for. We just thought that was good for transparency. And um, and the policy, I just want to mention, the policy is guidance. So staff will bring forward allocation recommendations based on this policy guidance, but it's up to council whether or not those funds get um, allocated in the way that the policy says so. So this is essentially a council policy. It's not a policy that tells staff what to do, except for it tells us to bring forward recommendations to you. So that's an important point because really what it means is you, every year you could ignore the recommendations and go against the policy advice because it's your policy. It's your policy to help guide your decisions. So we've got a little decision tree in the a policy which kind of demonstrates the hierarchy um, that's recommended in the, in the current draft of the policy. Um, first of all, we're saying we should keep the financial and service level stability reserve at $500,000. Council established that reserve last year when they first allocated some of the surplus. Essentially that, that uh, stability reserve could act as a temporary measure for parks, rec, and culture, for instance, and during an economic downturn, or perhaps um, if we had just temporary demands on our bu building and planning uh, department, um, but you, you didn't want to fund that um, perpetually because those demands would go away or another um, you know economic impact that was temporary in nature. So we recommend keeping that at a $500,000 minimum. If it's not there, we suggest um, uh, allocating the budgetary surplus to that reserve for that reason. Then if, if that um, uh, condition is met, we recommend allocating the police surplus to the major crimes reserve to a maximum balance of $2.5 million. Um, we did a little um, uh, 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 consultation with the police department and uh, essentially a major crime this in today's dollars can cost between, you know, $1 million and $2.5 million was, was the estimates. Um, and, uh, you know, there was a, there was a point uh, in 2021 when we almost reached a million dollars in there. And uh, there was a recent uh, major crime which which uh, eight, uh, uh, you, which would have used a lot of that reserve had the police department not already had an operating budget reserve. Uh, so it's just a, a, um, a ballpark of what a major crime could cost. Uh, if if we've re and, and if the police surplus has been allocated and or the major crimes reserve reaches 2.5 million dollars, uh, then um, we also recommend allocating 
the parks rec and culture surplus to the financial and service level stability reserve. Again, the same idea is uh, if there's an economic downturn, there's a, an alternate funding source if, if the ec economics are temporary, like we're hoping uh, COVID-19 uh, was to that department. Um, and, and we sort of showed the history of um, the Parks, Rec and Culture budgetary surplus over the last 10 years prior to COVID. And those surpluses would have most likely uh, funded the shortfall in revenue that we've experienced um, since then. And so that, that's the uh, um, motivation behind that. Um, step four, we want to make sure that council priority projects are funded for the current term. Um, we haven't had a problem doing that by allocating surplus previously. So e everything in the council priority projects are currently funded, um, but we don't want to lose sight of that. So that's in the policy. And then we re recommend uh, allocating the rest to the infrastructure renewal reserve. And that's just based on uh, the CFO looking forward and seeing what the demands for our uh, you know, highest demands for our funding is going to uh, be needed in the near future. Uh, so, uh, your chair, thank you very much. That's uh, 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 the conclusion of my uh, presentation. I'm more than happy to answer questions you may have. Thanks very much. Go to Councillor Patterson first and then Councillor Smart. Thank you, Acting Mayor, and through you to uh, Director Payne, thank you for the presentation and the clarification about um, the intent of the surplus allocation policy, and I generally do agree with it. I will raise, of course, the ask that I always have, and uh, uh, hope that we are working towards actually for all the reserve funds developing um, for even greater transparency and, and clarity particularly for residents in the community, minimum and optimal reserve balances for all of the reserve funds. I think that also would aid um, quick decision making for council if with the list of the funds that there were in fact minimum and optimal reserves. Now I realize that I asked for these originally when we really had very little in reserves, so it, it would not have been meaningful at that time. But as progress is made on um, on our setting aside money um, for, or allocating funds in reserves, um, I, I would really like to see us move towards having minimum and optimal reserve fund balances identified also. And I'm wondering if our director can speak to that. Thanks very much, uh, Director Payne. Uh, thank you through the chair. Uh, it, it's a, it is a good point, and you see evidence of that sort of showing up in the draft policy. You know, we've got target um, reserve balances for some of the operating accounts, such as the major crimes reserve um, and uh, the financials and service level stability reserve. Um, but what we don't have is targets really for the bigger reserves, like the infrastructure reserves. And I, I do believe that's what's being referenced here. And yes, I you know I, I've heard that comment, and I agree with that comment. You know, at the current uh, stage of our life cycle of replacement of our assets, um, we've just got um, so many assets and the value of those assets overdue for replacement that uh, setting a target reserve um, at this point, uh, it lacks a lot of meaning only because um, our short term priorities are kind of um, clear, right? Uh, as much capital output as we can in the near in the near term and raising our taxes such that those reserves are funded robustly and it'll be a while before we can start uh, before we start uh, setting optimal uh, reserve targets that will be met and not spent immediately <laughs> mind you when i say, as i say that um our, our infrastructure reserve balances have been climbing and that's simply because of our inability to um, get capital output going. Uh, but I do see that um, escalating quite quickly with the, the hiring of our, of our engineering staff um, it's, and, and development of our comprehensive asset management plan. Uh, it's a pretty exciting time in that regard. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, I'll go to Councillor Smart next. Well, thank you uh, through you, Acting Mayor. I just wondered in the, uh, and I again really do appreciate um, the policy and all the, the thought that's gone um, behind it. Um, uh, I guess the one thing that really um, um, stood out to me though was just um, 
in thinking about our increased uh, ability to deal with climate action mitigation and adaptation, did, was that considered as one of the reserves that you might prioritize under this policy? And, and if not, um, why not? Thank you very much, Count, uh, Director Payne. Uh, through the chair, and thank you very much. I appreciate that question, and I'll say it, it wasn't really something that was considered uh, directly uh, when developing this policy. And the reason for that was uh, we developed this policy to align with what I would say the financial needs are it, uh, the greatest in our financial plan. Uh, that doesn't mean that climate mitigation um, uh, isn't important and isn't in our, our financial plan uh, whatsoever, but the proportion of what is spent on climate mitigation compared to infrastructure and other things um, and the financial stability considerations um, is one reason why it's not. Now, that that being said, you know, you may be in a situation where you uh, your chicken before the egg or egg before the chicken situation where if you are allocating funds uh, to cl a climate mitigation reserve, perhaps that incentivizes council to spend more on climate mitigation. Or maybe the other th other way around where council uh, directs staff to increase climate mitigation spending in the budget, and that uh, incentivizes the allocation of reserve funds for that reason. So um, so it, it, it is, is absolutely council's prerogative uh, every single year, as I mentioned. Um, and if um, and, and if that, that need is great in any given year, council can direct that staff uh, allocate funds accordingly. Thank you very much. And I have uh, Mayor Murdoch on the speaking list next. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just a quick question to Mr. Payne. I notice that these are fixed numbers. Is there any thought of perhaps in our policy having these indexed in some way so that we don't have to go back in 10 years and change the numbers dramatically as they account more for a more realistic uh, achieving the same goals? Uh, thank you, Mayor. And uh, to you, Director Payne. Uh, through your chair, uh, a good suggestion. You know, for instance, you could translate the two point five million dollar major crimes reserve target into uh, something more qualitative, such as um, as what the CFO um, uh, believes as an adequate funding for a typical major crime reserve or major crime or something like that. Um, uh, that would be a great way. Uh, um, no objection to that. That's a good suggestion. Just one other comment here. I think you mentioned the two and a half million. The, the report says one and a half million for the major crime reserves. Just want to make sure that we're we're using the right number. I think the I think the, in the report and the bylaw it references one and a half million. I think that's the correct. correct. Yeah, it's, it's one point five million. The presentation had two point five, which is uh, erroneous. But yeah, thank okay. you. Nope, thank no you for problem. that. Just that we're all talking about the same things. Um, and I guess the last question was just: Is there any thought to? Um, one of the other aspects of the uh, 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 parks rec and culture is that they have their own sort of capital improvement um, uh, requirements, and I'm wondering if they're. Uh, I've thought about this. So we've had this discussion at, at times over the years where uh, surpluses from park recreation and culture stay in park rec and culture and can be used for them to do uh, other improvements to help sort of build their business. Um, this speaks to just a. Uh, service stability, service level stability reserve. But is there any, would, it, would something like a like a fifty fifty split where that money was went half to you know into an FLSR and or maybe a million into that and a million into uh, into capital works uh, options or something of that nature? Um, just thinking along the time in terms of allowing the the money within parks recreation and culture to stay essentially within that same closed loop. Uh, Director Payne. Uh, through the, through the chair. Uh, yeah, that would be. Uh, a completely accomplishable. Um, you know, we have the capital works reserve uh, in the um, in the financial statements. The capital works reserve is broken down into about five major categories. We we um, uh, simplified that internally as staff. One of those major capital one of those major categories is parks, rec, and culture capital itself, because we do find that the user fees. Um, even the proportion of uh, of the budget that is user fee funded uh, do doesn't pay for uh, the major infrastructure replacement for the reserves. It's mostly just equipment and other chattels that can be funded through the user fees. So, so we have established other reserves in the capital works reserves specifically for parks, rec, and culture, and it, it could certainly be directed there. 
Thank you, uh, Mayor Murdoch. Yeah, just one last question on that. It was just the, just question about the $2 million uh, financial stability reserve for Parks, Rec, and Culture. It seems, to my layperson's mind, high given the 500000 for the rest of the municipality. Uh, can you just give a brief explanation of the rationale for that number? Thank you. Uh, Director Payne. Uh, th through the chair, sorry, can you could you clarify? So, uh, just the are you asking the parks, rec, and culture component of the financial and stability or financial service level stability reserve being two million and the total value being two point five million? Is that what you're referring to? Um, yeah, the the way it's worded in here is there's a financial and service level stability reserve uh, for a minimum balance of five hundred thousand. And then the Parks, Rec, and Culture has a financial and service li level stability reserve up to a maximum of two million. It, they're broken out like that. Is that? I'm just I'm just curious about that that breakdown, or, or should it be thought of as more of a two and a half million dollar total financial stability reserve? Director Payne. Uh, through the chair. Well, the, the two million dollar is a ceiling, um, whereas the five hundred thousand dollars is a floor. So the five hundred thousand dollars is meant to be a, a floor for financial stability period. Uh, it's certainly not the optimal level of the uh, reserve balance overall. Um, so they, they, they're they not exactly related in that way. Okay, I appreciate it. I didn't, uh, I didn't catch the minimum versus maximum language in that, so I appreciate that clarification. Thank you, and back to you, Chair. Thank you, and I'll go to Councillor Green next. Thank you very much, Acting Mayor. And through you to Mr. Payne, thank you very much for the report, Mr. Payne. And one of the things that has cropped up for me just in, in thinking about this particular area, because it is critical to the future, and it's about long-term planning as well, um, would it be possible to, to include a pros and cons section in your reports, uh, especially in regards to the allocation of reserves? But for each recommendation, if, if you were in that in that situation of, of making important recommendations, um, a pros and cons section for each recommendation. Is that something that you've considered or would be willing to consider? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Director Payne. Uh, through the chair, if the question is... Uh, when I'm, you know, supposing that council approves this policy and then now it's time to make a decision on allocating the surplus, uh, whether or not I can bring forward pros and cons of every uh, recommendation of that surplus allocation. Absolutely, that uh, I'd be happy to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you, Acting Mayor. And, and now I'll go to um, Councillor Watson. Thank you, Acting Mayor, and through you to uh, Director Payne. Um, I, uh, first of all, just um, uh, 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 I wanted to just ask questions of clarification for myself. I know you've uh, included Appendix A, which is this annual surplus allocation decision, decision tree, um, uh, and that's really helpful. Um, I just wanted to get a sense of how often, maybe going back 10 years, council would have been a, in a position to actually have to make these decisions. Like, uh, th will there be some years when we would, uh, there will be no surplus, and so therefore it's moot, or is this generally an annual um, uh, activity of council? So that's my first question. Thank you, Director Payne. Uh, through the chair, I would say under current financial conditions and based on current council direction, uh, it will be common for there to be a budgetary surplus. Um, just as an example, um, you know, the, the, the police department, for instance, has a strength size and the current council policy is to fund the full strength size, even recognizing that there will be vacancies. And that allows the maximum opportunity for the service level that council has decided on. And that previously, that wasn't the case. Uh, you know, we may have a strength size of 23, but we budget for a strength of 22 and there, there would be a smaller surplus. Um, so I would say it's not uncommon over the last uh, four or five years um, less common previously, and, and council previously wasn't making this allocation decision. Um, it was essentially the the CAO, and then council affirmed it in the in, through the budget. Um, but there was no explicit conversation about surplus allocation as this policy would um, achieve. Uh, thank you. And then a follow up also for clarification in the in the decision tree. I just want to understand that you're suggesting at least again, as you're noting, this is policy and could be subject to change by council if we want to do otherwise, but um, that it's cascading in that 
like the first decision, until the fund reaches the maximum allocation, nothing would then drop down to two or three or four. Is that right? Or would it be a, it would be an even allocation if there was anything remaining after the um, after the uh, major crimes reserve had gone to one? Sorry, once the um, FSLSB had reached 500k. It would then the next decision would be has the major crimes got to 1.5 and if anything left over then drop to the next or is it an equal allocation between the four funds that you've suggested? Is Thank that, you, Councillor. So that's Watson. the clarification. Um, Count, the Director Payne. Uh, through the chair, it's I would say it's it's um, sort of a combination. It, it's somewhat cascading but not completely, and the reason being, for instance. You could have a major crimes reserve, let's say, is at five hundred thousand dollars, and supposing you produce a budget surplus of a million dollars, but none of that budget surplus came from the police operating reserve. None of it, therefore, would be allocated to the major crimes reserve. Same thing goes for parks and agriculture, uh, sort of thing. So you're directing budget budgetary surplus from specific departments, and I don't recommend doing that for most other departments. It's just that these two departments are vulnerable to. Uh, major swings in expenditures or economic downturns. Same with building and planning, um, and then the the rest would be ca would be cascading. For instance, if you can't fund your council priority initiatives, we do not fund the infrastructure renewal reserve uh, thereafter. Thank you. So that just leads to my final question, which I think you've partly answered in, it, which was really how you selected these four funds as the possible ones for the for the surplus allocation. And it sounds like it's for reasons you've just given because of their importance in the event that um, uh, we have particular events. So would that be true to say? Or would you just like to comment on how, again, maybe more generally, how you selected those four for for the, the, the policy, the draft policy? Thank you. Uh, Director Payne. Uh, through the chair, yeah, pretty close. You know, the, the selection was really based on two factors, the um, departments that are subject to most um, economic uncertainty or volatility. Uh, and so that's the service level continuity uh, uh, ob objective in the policy. And the other is focused on what you know I see as a CFO as the greatest financial need according to our financial plan, which would be the infrastructure renewal reserve. And again, that's that's a, you know the same the sa to answer um, uh, Councillor Smart's question. It's the same same rationale there um, is that. Um, uh, you know, we're really looking at financial stability and financial funding need as the criteria for determining the recommended reserve allocations. Uh, thank you. And I just wanted to say thank you very much for providing a marked up version of the policy. It's really easy to see what's happening when we see the before and then the changes in the documents. So I really appreciated that. Thank you, uh, Mr. Payne. Uh, thank you. If there's no further questions around this table, then I'm going to go to the public um, for anyone from the public who would like to ask a question or make comments on this um, on this item. Seeing none, I will come back to this table uh, and I will await to see what you would like to do. Move receipt of the report. Thank you. A second. Um, there's no discussion around receipt usually, so we will just call the question. All in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. Thank you. Any other motions coming up? If I, if I may ask a question. Uh, Absolutely. Chair, um, I'm just wondering if the, uh, actually perhaps I'll move that the, the recommendation that the amended reserves and surplus policy be approved as presented. Okay, moved and seconded. And then and I might just ask a question because I might have an amendment to that if that's acceptable. Absolutely. Uh, and that's just to uh, to Mr. Payne, uh, through you, Chair. Um, if, 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 I just want to get a sense from him if it makes sense to consider of some language that would allow um, indexing of the minimum uh, to kind of reflect uh, inflationary costs, and if there's any suggestions on wording of that, because I was thinking of around perhaps some some wording to um, that this be approved as presented, um, but given that it's a recommendation back to council, uh, that that staff also be directed to include any recommended language. Um, to allow for indexing of those minimums or something of that nature, but perhaps Mr. Payne has some suggestions on what would be appropriate. Thank you, uh, Director Payne. Uh, through the chair, I I, uh, I believe I 100% 
understand what's being asked of me, if that helps. It's difficult for me to craft emotion. Uh, I'm just not good at that, I suppose. Uh, okay. How about I, I do this, and since we, the motion is to, to for recommending to council that this be approved as presented, um, uh, I'll make a, I'll just, let me think here for a second about wording. Uh, Mr. Coase, are you ready to type something if I, if I include that? Uh, I'd like to amend that to, to um, uh, and ask staff to include options for indexing the uh, the fund minimums uh, in the report that comes to council. So we may make those changes at the council table. Is that? Did you get that, Mr. Coates? One more time, yeah. I didn't write it down. So uh, staff I'm... includes any um, options for indexing the funds. The fund minimums. The fund minimums. In their report to council, in this, when, when this comes to council. When it comes back to council, yeah. So staff includes uh, any options for indexing the fund minimums when it comes back to council, in the report when it comes back to council. Chair, could I, could I recommend just a slight change? Yes, please. Sorry, sorry for interjecting. Yes, I, I think um, indexing fund values uh, because some of the values in there are minimums, some of the values in there are maximums. Okay, I think that's that's good. Okay, so now it would read staff include any options for indexing fund values um, in the report when it comes back to council. Is that correct, Mayor Murdoch? That's fine with me. Yeah. Okay, do we have a seconder for that, Councilor Green? And do you need to motivate in any way, shape, or form? I don't want to change the policy on the fly. Uh, so I think if this, if they can bring back options for including that, if it makes sense, then that would allow us to make those changes at the council table. Um, it makes sense to me that rather than having to revamp the policy every few years to adjust the, the, the hard numbers, if we, there's a way of building it into the policy, we should do that. If it ends up being too complicated, I'm, I'm actually OK with it. But I think we should at least. Green. Um, I just wanted to suggest through you, Chair, to um, <laughs> Councillor Murdoch, to Mayor Murdoch, sorry, um, would it be helpful for the public just for their uh, sort of edification or information why this is significant and why this is important? I, I think it might be helpful just quickly. Would that be all right? Thank, Thank you. you. Mayor Murdoch. Um, sure, very briefly. Obviously, the, the minimums we're choosing here are, are somewhat uh, um, Arbitrary. The staff have looked at what they think is an appropriate level to make sure that our financial stability are, are, can be met, uh, and that we don't overfund certain grants or in certain levels. Uh, that being said, obviously we're currently in a high inflationary world, and if say this five to ten percent, in, you know, inflation carries on for another decade, these numbers would, in real terms, you know, have not have a lot of the same intentional meaning. So if there's some mechanism there that they adjust um, either through staff decision or through some sort of indexing process, um, it would make sense that you wouldn't then have to go back and make a, a one-off decision. And it, because these changes would happen, obviously, at more than every four years, you may often have very different people around the table and not have the context of why those were, were allocated in the first place. So um, generally speaking, I like financial policies that adjust incrementally and then it saves you from having to make major adjustments at some point in the future. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Watson. Yes, thank you, Acting Mayor. Through you to uh, Mayor Murdoch, it's just a question of clarification about your motion. Um, uh, you, the motion refers to a report back, but I, I take it to mean that what we're asking for is a redraft of the policy to include indexing, or are you actually asking for a report before the policy is redrafted? So I just wanted to be clear about what we're requesting. Thank staff. you, Mayor. And maybe I'll just make sure I'm not getting my, policy, my procedure here wrong, but with this recommendation from Committee of the Whole, it'll go to councils. We're recommending approval to council, and so my thought was if they can be attached to that when that comes to council, that there just be a little, we can make these changes to, uh, to accomplish that goal, then when we actually read the, uh, the policy into, into, into effect, then we can make those changes or not make them at that time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I don't hear it. See any more um, questions on this? So I'm going to call the question on the amendments. All in favor? Any opposed? 
Councillor Patterson is opposed. Um, and now I'll go to the main, and I, I assume, Councillor Appleton, that you are in favor since I haven't heard from you. Um, and I'll go down to the main motion. Any further discussion on the main motion? As amended? And it's up on the screen now, and Ca Councillor Appleton, I'm assuming that you can see that. I could read it off if you like, but I think you can see it. I can. Thank you so much. Okay, on the main motion, I'm going to call the question. All in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll Direct your pain. <laughs> uh, we'll now move on to uh, number 6.2, which is the blasting regulation changes. Next step, and we have our Director of Community Building and Planning Services, uh, Director Bull, to present. So, Director Bull. Thank you, Chair. A short introduction um, on this update to Council and a request for a direction. Um, the, the blasting uh, regulations uh, is something that had been discussed a couple of times in the past. Uh, in this context, most notably in 2020, when Council asked for uh, a report back on uh, some changes. Initially to the blasting regulation was the thought back then, and then later to the um, uh, noise bylaw. Um, um, this was a response to resident concerns around blasting. Um, the report gives some further background to uh, the level of blasting that we see in our community. It's about 8 to 12 permits a year, different locations throughout the community. It's a small percentage compared to the overall number of permits, uh, but of course it's a very noticeable type of construction uh, activity. Um, currently our um, building bylaw um, basically requires a permit that relies on notification. Uh, there's very limited checking on the part of staff in terms of the details of blasting because that's also overseen by the federal government. Um, and ho ramming is not a concern that came up back then, and which is normal, considered at this point in, under our regulations a normal construction activity. Uh, let me see. Um, to date, uh, this project has been researched on and off a bit, uh, and that had to do with uh, staffing changes and lack of. Uh, uh, resources to really dedicate some time to it, but some research has been done, uh, staff input has been gathered, and particularly uh, our consultant has looked at the West of Vancouver example as one of the uh, leading examples in blasting bylaws. It's a very extensive bylaw, uh, but it has a lot of ideas that might be relevant for Oak Bay as well. Uh, the report also comments on official community plan policies that um, uh, give some indication more in, in general term about um, uh, environment policies um, um, and what could be considered around uh, blasting, uh, around retaining natural, natural landscapes and forms. Um, in the report there's a table, table summarizing a couple of elements from the West Vancouver bylaw that have been shortlisted for further review by staff. And um, when we reached this point in uh, March and I got a good sense of uh, where this project was at, we decided to come back to you to give you an update. There's a couple of options for next steps. And knowing that this is not quite a uh, council priority project, uh, but it is one of the actions that had been kept on uh, the list of to-dos in the past, so it has not been abandoned at any point just yet. But it is somewhere between something small to do and an actual project. So uh, that's where today the staff report uh, Acknowledging that there's a lot of other projects pending that needs to be needed to be started as well, and uh, we, d we still have limited resources, but we are uh, getting ready for some other projects. So our recommendation is to continue the process with an administrative uh, review and simply come forward with the changes that were asked, knowing concerns that we are aware of from the community. There's also uh, some other options in the report in case uh, you decide to take a different approach. Uh, there could be, for example, option two is to include at least one public meeting. Option three is a much more extensive consultation, which more much more like a council priority project. Um, and option four is to uh, consider this as a council priority project, but later this year, when we also look at other projects we might want to fund and activate for next year. So those options that include consultation, they are not quite in the current work plan. They would push some other work around. Uh, with the one public meeting, of course, being the more limited option and the other ones more extensive. So, uh, yeah, this is in front of you as an update and to hear your thoughts about what is an appropriate process for uh, next steps here. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so I'm going to come to this table first and then we'll go to the public. So does anyone have any comments around this table? 
Uh, Councillor Green, you can go first, then Watson and Smart. Thank you, uh, Acting Mayor. Just quickly, um, first of all, through you to Mr. Bull, thank you very much for this report. Um, this has been on my radar for quite a long time, and I know also on Councillor Braithwaite's radar, um, I've, I've recalled, I have recalled issues beginning, I think they were heightened in 2020 during lockdown and COVID. People were at home, working from home. Um, it, it, I recall issues on McNeil, on Prospect, on Deal, um, on other, in, in other places. Um, ho ramming in particular was egregious for noise and um, it, it, it really caused a lot of reaction. And there is also real concerns about this kind of activity blasting and ho ramming, for instance, in um, areas where there are heritage homes um, because they are especially potentially vulnerable to um, you know, agitation, ground agitation, rock breaking and that kind of thing. So it's, it's been an ongoing issue and um, I, I would like to see us do as much as we can to regulate this activity um, and to ensure that um, neighborhoods are uh, in, some, in some way protected. Um, so that's, those are my general comments, but I do appreciate the report and the options that you've provided. Thank you. Thank you, and, and I think we'll stick to, to questions just now, and then we'll come to comments afterwards. That's fine. Um, I have uh, Councillor Watson on the on the speakers list next. Uh, thank you. Yes, a question to Director Bull, please. Um, and it, it is just about um, uh, infill residential permit areas, uh, which um, I just want to be sure that I have followed this through correctly. Is it correct that um, blasting permits um, uh, would be required only in the event that a DPA was um, uh, activated and that that would not apply unless somebody was actually creating, rezoning to create additional units. So the infill residential permit areas, although it's the entire residential part of the municipality, that it only kicks in when there's rezoning to add a unit. So this would not apply, this, 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 um, uh, the, um, the provisions would not apply when, a sing when somebody was blasting in order to replace a single family home with another single family home. So I, I just wanted to question you about that. Thank you, Director Bull. Thanks, uh, through the Chair. Um, no, there's not really a separation there. I think the type of change that we have in mind would, would apply across the board for any blasting activity uh, throughout the district. Thanks. Not just whether a deep DPA was required or not? No, no, okay. it's not. Thank, um, thank you, I wasn't sure about that. That's helpful. Uh, thank you. I'm actually with uh, with everyone's indulgence. I'm going to go to Councillor Appleton next, as he hasn't spoken yet tonight. So, Councillor Appleton, you're up. But you're not unmuted. Um, thanks very much, Madam Chair. Can you hear me okay now? Yes, we can. Thank you. The zoom, the zoom was going a bit west there, so it's getting better though. Um, thanks very much. So through you uh, to Mr. Bull. Thank you, Mr. Bull, for the report. I have a couple of uh, questions. Is the uh, shortlisted elements for consideration uh, in the table that's under analysis, is that uh, sort of in, in brief what is being considered for administrative changes? So is, if, if something's on there, is that sort of something that's being contemplated by staff as being... Um, as being on the uh, the start list for that those bylaw amendments, or is there it, or is there adi information additional to that? Thank you, uh, uh, Director Bull. Yeah, through the chair, the, the column that says shortlisted elements for Oak Bay consideration. Those are the elements we would be reviewing and coming back with uh, with specific changes. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Appleton. Do you have another question? Yeah, just two quick follow-ups, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Um, with respect to, I, I noticed that on that table, um, there's uh, we're, we're, there's not a considered element around a limitation on the amount of rock breaking. Um, and I just wanted to ask, is that something that is going to cause a um, essentially is is that not is is that not on there because there's a significant staff management uh, element to that, or is that going to create a sort of a resource draw on building and planning to monitor that or create the parameters around that? Is that why that's not included, or is there another reason for that? Uh, thank you, and uh, Director Bull. 
Yeah, through the chair. There's two references to this in the in the table. Uh, on the first line, there is uh, the West Vancouver uh, bylaw example has uh, provisions around it in general terms, and it is part of their permitting re requirements. Um, it is also listed later. I think that's what Councillor Appleton is referring to, uh, limiting the amount of rock breaking in single family or two dwelling zones. Um, yeah, that is one step up from. Um, a level of control and and review that that somehow we would need to have resources for um, it at first glance uh, that seemed um, a tall order plus i think if some of the other elements that we have selected there's a couple of uh, other improvements that we can do first thank you uh, thank you councillor appleton yes thanks for that and just very quickly so i'm, I'm interested in the idea that the West Vancouver bylaw under under com, that's being compared to here uh, actually includes, uh, as if I read this correctly, essentially uh, prohibits uh, hoe ramming completely uh, in favor of other methodologies, uh, which I think is an interesting one. Um, what's the availability? Like, are are these esoteric methods, or are these methods that are broadly available uh, to to a builder? Um, in Oak Bay on the South Island. And that may not be something that Mr. Bull can answer, but um, I, I only have passing knowledge of the alternative methods here, uh, chemical grouting and hydraulic, you know, a hydraulic fracturing. I think I can kind of assume what that looks like, but I'm just wondering, are these uh, broadly available method techniques? Can, can we offer those as something that would be an alternative? Uh, thank you, Councillor Appleton. Uh, Director Bull. Yeah, through the chair. Um, I did have a discussion leading up to this report about chemical crowding, grouting. We don't have a lot of expertise in our staff, but uh, on this particular topic. Um, but we are aware of that process. Um, one of my colleagues was familiar with it. It has been around for about 20 years, but it's not very frequently used because of the uh, price point. And I, I can't really comment on the other topics there that would uh, require some further review. But um, yeah, back to the uh, original point there. Uh, yes, I, I do think that the West Vancouver bylaw there specifically just wants to discourage rock hammering because that's one of the activities that takes a long time and is quite noisy. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Do you have anything else, Councillor Appleton? No, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. I'll go now to um, Councillor Smart. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, through you, Acting Mayor to Director Bull. Um, in looking at this chart and evaluating um, the shortlisted items for consideration, I'm wondering at this point in time, does, I guess when I look at this, I think about the three metrics of the specific benefit to the resident, the cost to the development overall if this is implemented, um, and then the impact on the environment. And I'm wondering, is, is that information that staff currently has when they've made this shortlist or is it um, information that uh, we would now um, give direction in order to obtain that valuable information to to realize if these shortlisted items should be considered uh, thank you director bull yeah through the chair um, the, the shortlist is mainly has been selected and determined based on um, the, the concerns around the noise particularly I think that we are aware of from the community and um, options to in a effective but non-complicated way uh, take some measures to, to control that in a better way so a lot of other considerations around maybe potential impacts of different techniques we haven't really looked at that in detail um, it, it would require much more fulsome review and we probably need specialist uh, specialist expertise to do that Thank you. Uh, thank you. Another question, Councillor Smart. Yeah, my other question is just around, and I appreciate this one, you know, precedent um, sort of fast tracking us to some solutions. Um, but I'm wondering about what I see as some of potential really um, obvious solutions um, to mitigating the amount of blasting required, and that is fast tracking variances with regards to parking and setback variances when people are designing projects in order to not blast on their site, but they don't want to wait three years through approvals um, for variances. And I wondered if strategies like that potentially could also be included um, in this project. Thank you, uh, Director Bull. Yeah, through the chair. Um, um, on the topic of parking, um, it is one of the considerations for for uh, 
basements. Uh, but there's another uh, incentive at play here, or a reason why why in some cases um, blasting is uh, opted for. And even though the numbers are low, so it's not a very big incentive. Um, but um, um, full basements uh, are excluded from our floor area ratio calculations. And that seems to be, I asked what the reason was for most of the blasting permits. It's usually full full basement, sometimes a pool. And that is because if you uh, stay bis below a certain height, um, uh, that is not counted to your your the, the limits the size limits of your house basically, so um, um, yeah maybe um, there could be a look at options around that particular mechanism but it, it's a uh, that's also another topic that is can become uh, quite complex because uh, there's other reasons why we approach uh, floor area ratio uh, for that reason in. Uh, in the zoning bylaw, uh, but that's one of the backgrounds to that, uh, the need. So it's usually not a parking uh, layer, it's really the full basement that uh, the, the homeowners are interested in at that point. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Smart, anything else? Uh, just one last question, just with regards to the stage that we're at now and moving forward. Um, would the ne Can you just elaborate what the next stage would be if we passed the recommended um, motion today, what council would receive next. Thank you, and Director Boll. Uh, for you, Chair, um, uh, based on if we, if the, if our recommendations are supported, um, I would continue to work with the consultant that has been working on this, uh, prepare uh, draft regulations over the summer. Let me see, I had a little plan in here that I just flipped past. Um, and we would bring back uh, the, the bail amendments um, late summer in the fall uh, for your consideration so you can make some updates. That would be our uh, planning for that th that kind of follow-up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Mayor Murdoch. Thank you, Chair. Just for my clarification, there was a, in a, one of the letters, the question was asked, and I didn't know the answer, was the uh, just the process for obtaining a, a blasting permit. Is it tied to a building permit? Like, is the blasting limited to the footprint of the house or the, or the structure, like a pool? Um, just curious about what that how these things get triggered. Thank you. Uh, Director Bull. Yeah, through the chair, it's 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 usually in conjunction with a building permit, but not ex exclusively, because sometimes uh, there are blasting permits specifically for driveways, for site preparations, uh, that might not be at the building permit stage yet. Uh, so it's it's the blasting activity itself that requires uh, our notification uh, requirements in the, in the building bylaw. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else, Mayor Murdoch? Um, yeah, just so I th the only other question I really had was just, is there any mechanism or any, is there, does any jurisdiction look at, uh, just as opposed to banning or, or allowing, attaching a cost to rock removal? Um, certainly there's a direct impact on the municipality of these very heavy trucks on our infrastructure driving over them. And so I was just curious if there's any um, any precedent for allowing for fees to reflect, uh, to be reflective of the volume of, of rock removed as opposed to a ban or, or an allowance. Thank you. Um, and Director Bull. Yeah, through the Mayor, uh, I am not aware of specific examples, um, but I, I, um, that's something we could look into. Um, yeah, I know there's a number of other communities with examples as well, and um, um, that's what I uh, know about it at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Director Bull. Anything else, Mayor Murdoch? Uh, just in, in broad terms, I'm supportive of option two. I think a little bit more input, and certainly from industry to understand what the what the actual impacts are would be helpful. Uh, but also to think about this in the context a little bit outside of COVID um, would be helpful as well. So I think a, a little bit of additional consultation, to my mind, is, is worthwhile. Um, but I don't think we should delay it any more than we absolutely have to. So thank you. Thank you. I'll take that as almost a question. Um, <laughs> and, uh, does anybody else have any questions around the table? Uh, Councillor Green, and then I'll be going to um, to the public. And just a reminder to the public that we do have we have received. Oh, I'm Councillor Patterson. Um, I'll go to Councillor Patterson first, actually, before Councillor Green, because she's a first-time speaker. But just to remind the the public that we um, have received a lot of letters. We have all read all of your letters. Um, so when you do come up to speak, if you could speak on, uh, you don't have to come up and repeat what is in your letter. If you'd like to bring some new information to the table. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Uh, and Councillor Patterson. Thank you, Acting Mayor, and uh, th 
thank you, uh, Director Bull, for the report. I think that it's um, it has been a, a subject of a, a lot of discussion over the last few years. I also am, am leaning towards option two as, as a way to quickly um, get into the policy some of the um, some of the aspirations we would have to make changes. One thing that I, I know that is not um, not really in here, and I would definitely like to get the whole ramming excluded. But one thing I, I that is not in here and that has been um, a subject of great discussion in the community is the um, the notice period for blasting. And that it can sometimes the period of notice is very brief before the blasting starts, and um, seems to it seems to not be very concise for people to be able to plan around it. And particularly with things like home-based businesses now, more people doing work from home, um, understanding the hours that the blasting will take place are really more important. My own experience has been the notice was in the mailbox and 10 minutes later they were ready to start blasting. So I don't, I don't find that acceptable, and I'm wondering if um, provision could also be made um, with these to to somehow ensure that we have a, a more respons more community responsive management of the of the blasting itself. Thank you, Director Bull. Uh, through the chair, um, there is um, there is an option in the table that we are going to be looking at. It's kind of approaches it from the other end uh, because uh, our blasting permits are also not uh, time limited. So you could also hold off very long and then claim you did the notification in the past, right? Um, so uh, the West Vancouver example uh, limits, puts a kind of a deadline on by that time you will be done. But re related to that, I, I know that our uh, regulations do have a, a, a short notification window that we apply ourselves. Uh, maybe we can look at that context if there is uh, some tweaking that could be considered and uh, brought back of, as part of that uh, item that we're going to look into anyway. Uh, thank you. And I'll go to Councillor Green for the second time. Yes, thank you, Acting Mayor, and, and to, through you to, to Director Bull. W would it be possible to include in your analysis, please, um, Director Bull, a, a, um, a comment or analysis on the health and safety, public health and safety ramifications of, of this kind of activity? I know for a fact that on Prospect Place, during um, prolonged uh, blasting and so on, that air quality was a real issue, as well as noise, um, both affected people directly and I think I think we would be remiss in not at least including public health and safety in terms of noise and air pollution as as part of our examination so if that would be possible that would be terrific and I had a question I think it may have already been answered by others but to Councillor Smart's question and Mayor Murdoch's comments on the public consultation piece, um, you said that you would be working with a consultant this fall to continue the work. And was public consultation part of that? That was my question. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Green. Uh, Director Bull. Yeah, through the chair, um, consultation is not included in the uh, staff recommendation, but in option two, uh, it is included. And there's three and four as well, but three and four likely would take place at a different timing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, I think we're ready to go to the public now. Um, so, uh, members of the public, if you'd like to come to the table, and just a reminder, if you have written a letter, we all have read it already, so um, please uh, direct your comments to something other than the, the what, what was written in your letter. Thank you. Just uh, introduce yourself and, um, and your area of... of, uh, uh, of residence, Bob Wallace, Mr. 1584 Wallace. Prospect Place. Um, and uh, I'm here to talk above or beyond what I sent, and I, I don't know if others have sent this to the uh, council, mayor and council. Um, the one area that I do know something about is seismic. I have doodle bug it, and I know what seismic means. Seismic is a, is a basically when you set up what is happening below the earth. So what I'm here to try to uh, find out if it w w sh would uh, should be included is that the there is a way of measuring that and that is by say uh, it's probably 
much more uh, scientific <clears throat> than when I did it, but it basically measures what is happening sub subterranean. So that doesn't include just Prospect Place. We have many other areas that have uh, our heritage and many other places that need to be, in my opinion, to be developed. But that means that you can actually quantify in that area what is happening underground. Now, that we are a lot of rock in, some, in Oak Bay and other places, of course. But the repercussions uh, can be very damaging, maybe not now. It is of historic nature. So that we'll be able to find out what has happened. And I heard, I hope, although I think I'd like to see writing, name, uh, running uh, translations of what everybody's talking about, because I, did, I demand that I'm, I'm not going deaf. But, um, but the fact is that you can measure what outages happen. And that could be get, gotten around by any developer by saying, I need this done. But each application could be for five tons, six tons, whatever it may be. But if there was some absolute uh, direction by council, carried out by staff, that the real f uh, measure of the amount of ore taken out can be uh, set before any construction, reconstruction, whatever it may be, is requested. So it doesn't preclude somebody with some small little thing in the garden that they want to have rid of, but it's more for any large, uh, large constructions or et cetera. The noise area, et cetera, is another area that I find uh, very, very bad. The only thing it did where around us was scare the deer away. So, and that, that's a hell of an expensive way to get rid of deer. But uh, the uh, situation is that we also have uh, uh, the idea that the costs to any developer w would go up because it would be much more expensive to carry out the ideas that, I'm cost that would be a cost factor. Seismograph uh, graphing is not inexpensive. But the idea that a house, uh, uh, I live in a house with no crawl space, on cement, on rock. Uh, so I don't have, it, so it can be done. And all it needs is a good architect to be able to, to figure this out in some, in some areas. Other times there are certain things that could happen. Um, we seem to be on the defense on this whole thing about dra about uh, blasting. I think it's time to go on offense. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Wallace. Anyone else wishing to come forward to speak? I'll ask for a second time. Uh, there's no one online, I don't believe, Miss Leach. Nope. Anybody else in the audience who would like to come and speak? And I will ask for a third time if anyone would like to come and speak. Nope. Okay. Good. Uh, then we'll come back to this table, please. Councillor Smart. Um, to you, Acting Merit, this is the time to give general comments. Absolutely. So I, this is a very real problem, and I'm really glad to see this before us. Um, you know, this is not a small noise concern and the building damage is real. So I'm very supportive of looking at this. I am, however, in looking at the report so far, very concerned about the lack of data around all of these I ideas um, to date. Um, I really think it's important that when we look at each specific benefit, whether that be noise or building damage or, you know, overall concern for the environment, that we have very specific information on are we getting a 50% reduction of noisy days with this particular thing that might um, create a hardship for creating affordable housing? Um, are we getting a 75% less reduction in building damage? We need, we need, 
we, it's so tempting just to say yes to all of these things because this is a real problem that we need to address, but we have to go in eyes open. And so I'm very supportive of option two um, uh, with the caveat of I think we need to involve uh, designers as, as well because um, they're a big part of coming up with creative solutions in consultation. Um, and I just, I'm very worried about this becoming an anti-development project um, that prevents the very important building that we need to do. Uh, thank you, um, Councillor Smart, uh, Councillor Green, and then Mayor Murda. Thank you very much, Acting Mayor. Just a brief overview. I know this has been a concern of the Heritage Commission for at least the last number of years that I've lived here. Um, I was liaison to Heritage in 2011 to 2014, and it, it was first raised at that table with me. I'm sure it was raised prior to my involvement, but it has been an ongoing concern. Um, and there have been examples around Oak Bay where um, Heritage homes were potentially implicated in the uh, fallout from either hole ramming and or blasting. So this has been a concern for quite some time. Um, I really appreciate the report. Um, I too, at the time we first discussed it, I think in 2020, um, we, I think a couple of us at least had researched the West Vancouver bylaw, which was brought to my attention by one of the Heritage Commission members. And that was really helpful. And so I think it is a good model. It appears to be a best practices model. Um, but I, um, I too am uh, aware of the fact that that this um, this could be perceived as um, trying to slow development or change the potential for development, and I, that is not the case. I think we all have a responsibility at this table, at least, to check our our uh, concerns and opinions about that and make sure that we communicate clearly to the public that this is first and foremost an issue around public health and safety and noise and and pollution. That's a big one, and as well the vulnerability of certain properties that are adjacent to um, this kind of activity. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mayor Murdoch. I'm just interested in moving this forward. I'd, I'd like to move option two with a slightly different wording, just a reflection of what was commented on here. Um, basically the same wording, but just where it says affected contractors, um, put uh, the words of, of input from the building industry and affected contractors so that there's this input from the public building industry and affected contractors is that so that's uh, that would that change so I, that'll be my motion so option two with that slight change to the wording and mr coates did you get that okay so with that adjusted wording um do we have a seconder for that motion uh councillor green has seconded would you care to motivate it all mayor no, what I've heard around this table, there's a legitimate concern around blasting the impacts, um, but also that there deserves to be a, a bit of a sober look at it to make sure that the changes are proportional to the value and to the impacts that they will have, um, that they're actually achieving the goals that we're trying to achieve, and that'll be uh, that'll come from both the public and from the industry as we understand uh, what the ramifications are. So I'm, I'm very supportive of this, and I really appreciate staff bringing forward option two as an option in here, as doing it as sort of a, a middle ground of, of some uh, in input without slowing down the process. So, thank you. Uh, thank you. Councillor Green, did you want to say anything else? No? Okay. Anyone else? Um, I'll jump in with my two bits. I thank you for that, I, and thank you for your comments, Councillor Green. Um, I'd be, be happy to support um, option number two um, as amended. So, if there's no other conversation around option two as amended, and is that a friend, can we take that as a friendly amendment? We've just, oh, it's not even an amendment, it's just a regular option. Okay, so uh, a regular motion. So uh, we have on the table, uh, and Councillor Appleton, I'm assuming you can see that? I can, Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so um, I'm going to call the question on this motion. All in favor? Any opposed? None opposed, motion carries, thank you. Uh, do we have to receive your report as well? Did we do that already? No. We didn't, we can. Okay, can I have a motion to receive the report? Moved and seconded. All in favor? Any opposed? Thank you so much. I think. Um, the next item is uh, number uh, 6.3, which is the land use procedure bylaw renewal. Uh, and it's our 
that's going to be our director of uh, community building and planning services. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Green is uh, currently away, otherwise he would have loved to be here as well and present himself, but we worked on this together and it's an important topic, um, like the others, uh, projects that need uh, a step forward to, to uh, hopefully a conclusion in the near future so we can start up some new big projects. Um, so this one is about the current land use procedure bylaw and the proposed new uh, development applications procedures bylaw. And uh, the outline of the presentation is as follows, uh, providing some backgrounds. I'll zoom in on what we're proposing around information meetings and public hearings, uh, delegation of authority options, fees and charges, financial implications, and uh, finally recommendations and options. And some background then. Um, so an in-stream project, I was hinting at it, but this is, this is a council priority project from the last term. It uh, wasn't completed at that time. Uh, was started in 2021, but paused in 2022, and uh, we're going to try to uh, complete it at this point. Um, there's also important context, meanwhile, uh, so in, 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 in that sense, not bad that we're still looking at this because we can include some, uh, some recent changes. Uh, the province had done a quite extensive review in 2019 called Development Approvals Re Process Review, short DEPR. Um, they've been working with municipalities across the province to, to find uh, time savings, efficiencies, and, and talk about what is a good process to have, and also what is, what is um, slowing sometimes municipalities down, right? And that, that some of that has feed, fed into a local government act change in 2021. The report is uh, mentioning 2022 here and there. It is actually 2021, and at, at that time, a couple of changes were made um, that uh, can now be considered in... Uh, in local procedures. The Housing Supply Act, of course, uh, that uh, has lately been getting a lot of attention. Those are all um, relevant uh, things uh, at the provincial level for this bylaw. Uh, there's also two other priority projects, but both of them have not been started yet, so they were added in May. Uh, one is called Service Optimization and Process Digitization, and number 60, the second one, uh, initiate administrative and policy changes in response to the provincial government uh, announcements that was specifically is specifically geared to what we in intend or sorry expect to hear in the fall around allowing multiple units per single family lot. Um, now we can't really plan for that just yet and those things need to come so those are related projects but also separate projects. Uh, the goal of this particular bylaw um, uh, revision and re replacement renewal is to create better in public, public input uh, opportunities. Uh, I'll make one comment there, I might make another slide, but I'll make it right away because while I think of it. Um, but one of the, that actually was discussed during the DEPR process. I was uh, at that point working with one of the communities that was interviewed for by the province. But one of the things that uh, I think is there's a consensus about is public hearing is not uh, the right moment to get public input. And, and most of the cases, uh, we, we have set up new routines and uh, practices that we get public input earlier, but the public hearing at the very end, that's when everything is already done. So um, um, in, in this case for our bylaw, a public information meeting is more formalized. I think it has been used in the past, but this bylaw would formalize that. Um, secondly, we're going to respond to local government exchanges. There's a slide with more details on that soon. Great, greater clarity for applicants. Uh, one of the features you will see in this bylaw is it has a lot of attachments that makes it a bit longer, but it's meant to be uh, provide a bit more accessibility that for different types of permit, there's a different attachment. So you only need to look at the relevant ones to, to understand the process rather to, to a more complex bylaw. And finally, uh, it also identify opportunities for efficiency. And there's one specific proposal today. Uh, the scope of changes then, as I mentioned, public information meetings have been added, uh, very high level, but su sufficient enough to make sure that before council considers a bylaw on an, uh, particularly on rezoning and OCP applications, uh, an information meeting would, would have been held. I'm, I'm misstating that actually. That is for OCP amendments and heritage revitalization agreements. Uh, for zoning bylaw, uh, it is slightly different, although I think the public information meeting would mostly, in most cases, be required. Um, Delegation of authority, I'll get into detail on that in a moment. Fees and charges is also an important topic. Um, um, and and, and all these, these particular changes lead to two new bylaws, actually. 
a new development application procedures bylaw and a new separate fees and charges bylaw. Um, zooming in on the information meetings and public hearings then. Um, so public hearings uh, and the act, that's one of the things that got changed. Uh, it's no longer a, a standing requirement for zoning bylaws, OCP, official community plans, um, particularly for zoning bylaws. If, if the zoning bylaw change is consistent with the official community plan, the hearing does not need to be held. There's still the requirement to um, notice, uh, give notice of the waiver, and that happens earlier in the process, and it's kind of supportive or in a way working with the public information meeting we intend to have around that time anyway. Um, next slide. Information meetings then, so um, already practiced but formalized in this bylaw, um, receive and gather public input earlier. Um, the process that has been set up in the uh, bylaw relies on the developer to or the applicant to do their information meeting, report back to us. But the nice thing about uh, triggering that requirement is that also in, um, typically gets council correspondence about topics of interest. And, and that's a good synergy, so to say, that we don't need to write down in the bylaw. Um, as I stated, that would be required for OCP amendments and HRAs, Heritage Revitalization Agreements, optional for rezoning applications, um, and the process requirements are listed in the bylaw. Um, delegation of authority, a bit of a different topic. Um, and a new topic for, for uh, Oak Bay. Um, th this delegation of authority literally means that uh, some of the approvals that council typically makes or has been making in the past for land use applications, uh, some of those could be delegated to staff um, with criteria. So that's an option you have. Uh, currently, you don't have that in place. So the district doesn't have that in place. They, they can be established. They are established by bylaw, and that's to make sure that there are criteria attached to it, so it's clear to the delegated authority uh, what the context is and what kind of cases can be considered and what the answer is on certain situations. And I'm saying staff, but it calls also delegation is also possible to other groups. Uh, but in this, this context for today, we're talking about staff delegation. Um, there's three options in the report, and those are really the all three major options that you have available to you. The first one, at this point, an option we haven't really um, delved into that much. It might be something for future con consideration. But uh, all your all the development permits that council considers, and that would extend to upland siting and design as a development permit-like approval, and heritage alteration permits, they can they can all be delegated. Um, usually, I if that happens, there's a distinction between minor ones and, and major ones. Major ones typically go to council and local communities as well. Uh, but minor ones could be delegated. Uh, the second one is notification of development variance permits. I have a bit more detail on the upcoming slide, but that's about um, the, the process of notification and then for subsequent variance. That's actually a very common uh, process for us. Thirdly, um, delegation of minor development variance permits. Um, and it's something else I will provide a little bit more detail on. Um, this one is a big one and not really uh, proposed at this point because it's uh, um, uh, a big step, I think. And I think we have a couple of other steps in mind that in the short run are, are uh, uh, should be considered first. Um, so I'll leave it at that. That's a list of different development permits that the district does uh, have in our OCP. We don't see a lot of them come by. Uh, because most of our uh, development activity is on single-family parcels, and therefore it's mostly variances and upland siding and design, and occasionally a bigger project. Um, this one is the more uh, relevant one today, because as staff, we are recommending to uh, consider this option and including it in the bylaw right away. So right now, uh, under the Act, or not, not right now, but that has been a standing requirement, for a development variance permit, so a variance, a, a break or flexibility on a typically a zoning bylaw requirement, sometimes uh, the parking facilities bylaw, it requires notice uh, for public hearings, notices given by staff. But in this case, for the variance uh, practice here, and like in other community, has been that council gives the notice, and that's kind of literally what the act calls for. However, there's also a fair amount of communities that are have been very comfortable delegating that to staff. And that means that a variance uh, report only comes to council once, and that's uh, after staff has initiated the notification, public input is gathered, 
and variance comes in front of council, including the public input received, with an option to provide input to uh, to you. And and in, in, for council, that means instead of seeing uh, variances twice, you would see them once. You don't have to try to separate the notification from the uh, consideration of the variance itself. Although in our setting, uh, you you have the option, right? When you decide a notification, if you really didn't like the application, you could write say right there and then. Um, this is not supported by council. Um, in terms of in terms of processing time, it would save time, uh, and that mainly has to do with um, the, the time it takes to to get stuff ready for council. A report needs to be drafted, it needs to be vetted. There's a lead time before we finalize the report and it's actually published, and you s you see it today and discuss it today. So there's some time savings there that could be achieved. Kay. Next slide. Um, then third, the other option, minor variance approval options. Um, that is a, n a new uh, option. Uh, varying bylaws was well, used to be reserved for councils or for board of variances. Uh, the local government act uh, selects a number of items that could be delegated to staff. Uh, those are zoning bylaw regulations uh, related to siting, size, dimensions of buildings, structures and permitted uses. Uh, off-street parking and loading space requirements, uh, sign regulations, and screening and landscaping requirements. Um, and if, if council is interested in that, that would require more follow-up work because uh, the way the local government um, assumes this is done or requires that this is done is, is through a bylaw and through clear criteria that set out this is this is what is considered a minor variance that staff can look at. And by the way, these are the criteria for approval or uh, rejection. Thank you. Um, next slide. Fees and charges, a, a different topic altogether. Um, and there's two uh, two elements here to discuss. Um, first of all, there's a bit of uh, fragmentation com, uh, uh, going on, in, at least in, in our view as staff. And that has to do with the fact that fees in Oak Bay are all tied to the relevant bylaw. So if there's a bylaw and it has an activity that requires a fee, the bylaw has the fees, which in itself is logical, right? For uh, for it's connected to the subject matter, but in the case of land development, uh, it becomes a bit um, complex because there's several bylaws that deal with land development, and I've listed them here: the land use procedure bylaw, the subdivision bylaw, board of variance bylaw, building bylaw, sign bylaw. So um, it's uh, challenging in a couple of ways. It's not very accessible. If somebody wants to know what are my fees, we really would need to create a fee sheet, perhaps. It's also hard to keep fees current that way because they're hidden in different bylaws and we don't really always take the time that it needs to look at fees and say, well, are they still up to date and current? Um, and actually, um, uh, we have also noticed that there have been occasions where uh, requests or actions come up and we don't have a fee at all. So we process them because that's part of the customer service. Um, but uh, there are a lot of uh, examples out there where some of these small small things, uh, they do require staff time and a lot of communities do require uh, fees for those. Um, so what we propose to do is to um, uh, create a single fees and charges bylaw, initially just for land use development related matters, but that bylaw could be added on. Um, um, some communities have opted to create a single fees and charges bylaw for everything in, in, in their municipality. And that is very practical for finance departments to to able to either infla uh, add inflationary uh, increases or just do a review and, and, and tweak the different pricing levels, so to say. So it would align with best practices, uh, facilitate a regular review. Um, the second topic to raise about fees, um, we also did a comparison and there's uh, kind of two uh, types of fees that we looked at. The building fees are very similar to our neighbors, be it a little bit lower by now, because over time uh, these fees get adjusted for different reasons and uh, that one is close but a little bit below. The situation is much different for uh, development application fees. They're they're very low compared to uh, other communities. And also in our view, and I, I discussed this with uh, Deputy Director Green as well, we were talking about, well, how, how much does time does it take to do, say, a rezoning application or an HRA? And we were looking at the fees. Is that reasonable, right? And it's, is it reasonable for 
uh, the amount of planning stuff that goes into it. But there's in those kind of more complex applications, there's also lots of other departments that get involved. So there's a lot of staff time that goes into these uh, applications to get it through council and then later on through the building permit process. It, it is quite far off in our in our opinion, and that's where we're recommending that uh, that should be looked at. Uh, we have attached an, uh, a comparison, an up-to-date comparison from our current fees with uh, a couple of our neighbors nearby. And you can see some of the discrepancies. Some of them are close, but some of them are really far off. And uh, that's something we'd love to get your support for to, to adjust. It kind of, um, yeah, it would also set us up better for in the future if there's different types of applications, like uh, infill housing program is something we're going to create. It's going to just uh, add to uh, the different types of applications, but then it's even more important to have good appropriate fees so that the cost is recovered at least to a, to a reasonable level. And finally, or one of the last pieces in the presentation, financial implications. So uh, just it's fairly high level this time on this particular topic, but adding the community information meetings uh, because it's held by applicants, there's no additional cost to the district. The delegation options, uh, they would ex ex expedite development approvals. They would reduce uh, demand for staffing resources. So there's a bit of savings there, but probably if we do, do it that way, uh, if we decide to go that route, then the fees would also be reflective of that. So it's probably a wash. Consolidating fees into a single bylaw is, is practical. And then finally, um, looking at particularly the development application fees, we could definitely uh, improve our cost recovery rate. Um, finally then, recommendations and options. Um, we are recommending to um, uh, move forward with the current draft bylaw. I forgot to mention, I think, that uh, we worked with uh, one of our uh, legal advisors on the bylaw, did a very extensive look uh, at all the present day regulation kind of references. So it's a really fresh bylaw that way. Uh, uh, so it it's, has been thoroughly done. So that is a draft bylaw that is ready or for your review and, and any changes you want to see. And then for the fees bylaw, we would like to uh, follow up on the comparison with neighbors and come up with a more, more um, up-to-date fees for our setting and, and bring that back at the same time when the other bylaw comes back so that you can uh, look at both bylaws simultaneously. Um, maybe another slide with options. Yes, there is. Um, there's a couple of additional options depending on the level of interest now, or maybe it's for later. Um, but you could also give us direction to uh, report back on draft criteria and provisions for minor variances and delegations to staff approval. Option three uh, takes that wider look at, at all kinds of development permits. Option four is uh, something completely else if, if you think there's other work that needs to be done first then uh, please let us know and we'll uh, first follow up on those items. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for your report. Um, I'll come to this table before we go to the public. Uh, and uh, Councillor Patterson, then Councillor Green. Thank you, Acting Mayor, and thank you, Mr. Bull, for bringing this forward. I. I particularly support the the single fee bylaw. It's, it does seem like a a positive step forward, both for um, tracking and managing how we compare to others. So I, I I think that's a very good suggestion. I guess in considering the um, the delegated authority for some of these um, things that you have talked about. Our experience has has unfortunately been that we have had relatively high staff turnover, particularly in in the building and planning department. And so I'm wondering if you could speak to um, the implications of that are associated with that and delegating authority in situations where uh, perhaps this, the staff do not have the knowledge and experience of a of the district in which they are, are working currently, or where um, perhaps OCPs are not regularly amended, kind of every five to ten years, as as is um, recommended, or even where bylaws and policies are are quite outdated and and therefore it, the interpretation may require more experience i i this is an area that i'm i'm just not clear how how it how current our information is to support delegated authority um, if if there's if there's adequate reference material to in fact move forward with this 
or if it is something that the council might need to hesitate and, and consider a little more fully. Thank you. I'm thinking that probably that's something that the people have to do as they come into the job would be to learn about that, but I'll let Ms. Director Bowl um, answer the question. Yeah, through the chair, um, it depends a bit um, what type of delegation we're talking about, but particularly for the minor variances, for example, as, as the kind of the 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 the, the easier ones, uh, those would need to be um, set up with clear criteria. The criteria would live live in a bylaw, so it would be really transparent. So yeah, uh, any any staff member um, should be able to. Uh, apply the bylaw and so it's really crisp and clear it also creates predictability for the applicant so that will uh, also police itself uh, I expect for for the larger development permits um, yeah uh, uh, unless other specific uh, criteria and limitations are put on it um, um, staff would would rely on for example the official community plan and whatever is in there that's very important so yeah if there were any sense that uh, some of the areas maybe are out of date or need a refresher, then, then definitely would be best to hold off in delegation and, and keep that in council's purview and be able to make those calls about, well, uh, things, that, things that need to be considered. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Patterson, anything else? And Yes, thank you. And just one simple thing, but I, I know I, I do hear a lot about it, and that is, um, uh, and I'm, I'm on side with staff having the authority to to um, uh, instruct about installation of the signs, but a lot of development signs that go up sit on the site for extended periods of time, and there's no date on them. Um, and I think that there a there's a, an enormous sense of frustration in the community that uh, the signs sit there and sit there and sit there, and then uh, residents hear about a meeting um, with a very short time period to in at fact be able to to speak with it and about it and so um, how how do how do communities deal with those signs and I've seen the same types of signs in other neighborhoods where they also don't have dates so this is certainly not limited to this community but I know that they're a source of irritation when they sit there for two or three years all of a sudden there's a meeting and they, the residents weren't expecting it and if if you turn around and say well there was a sign it's pretty frustrating Thank you, uh, Director Bull. Uh, through the chair, um, currently uh, the the sign is um, put up early, and that's uh, that's meant to make give people a heads up for starters, right? And we do have the development tracker, but I don't think all the residents would necessarily be aware of it. It would allow you to subscribe to updates, so you can follow along with how that progresses. Uh, in our proposed bylaw, we do have uh, development notification sign specifications. Uh, we decided what is. I think fairly common uh, and best practice in my opinion, but it does include the date on that sign. So uh, it would include the date of a public information meeting, uh, definitely the date of a public hearing. Um, so th that that is a bit of a tricky thing with public hearings because uh, it's a common challenge, right, in other communities as well, where then the site needs to be updated by the time the public hearing is called, and that's always a little bit of a dance. Um, I've seen two versions uh, inform the applicant to update their sign. I've also worked for one community that decided no, staff has control over the sign, so we'll take care of the updates ourselves, so we know it's done. Um, but yeah, our, our proposed approach would be to give a little bit more information on the sign, so to make sure that, that there is uh, clarity on, um, and this is specifically for um, required development application uh, notification signage. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Green. Thank you. Acting Mayor, and, and through you to Director Bull, um, thank you very much for this report. I, uh, I think it really says a lot. It tells us a lot, and it's long overdue in Obey. Um, and I think you've provided some tremendous background. Um, thank you for the expertise, um, and it shows leadership from your department as well. And I'm, I'm impressed with it. Um, just a question on the uh, fees, structure of fees, and so on increases, etc. And I agree with Councillor Patterson, the idea of consolidating makes total sense. Um, I'm just wondering, are there any implications, however, in the context of the new Housing Supply Act from the province? I know that at one point there, were, there, there was some commentary or media around the issue of fees and charges, and that they themselves might be barriers to um, 
to housing options as well. So I just wondered if, if I, I agree with increasing them, and I think that cost recovery is an issue for us because our tax base is pretty narrow. It's, you know, over 95% of it is derived from property taxes. So any way we can recover costs um, is important. But I just wondered if you had any comments on, uh, on the context of the Housing Supply Act. Are there any concerns there? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Director Bull. Yeah, through the chair, uh, I think the the discussion that you see in the media and 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 well, you know, and also I think in communities about what you, what kind of policy do you set set in place, put in place. Uh, I think the real big 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 um, concern is around community amenity contributions, for example, development cost charges. Those are much bigger charges that that have been set up in different ways. So kind of a, all kinds of ways how communities have it set up set up. It's usually not about the applications fees themselves. Um, the planning, land use application fees are, are fairly typically, well, I shouldn't say, I'm saying modest, but uh, that's of course in the eye of the beholder. But um, uh, I, I think those ones are, um, because they're focused on the on the staff time and, and more administrative fees rather than wider community amenity fees that result, uh, that ask for maybe park improvements or, or or streets. Uh, this is in that context uh, a minor, a minor portion of that that cost. So uh, in that sense, I, I think um, um, it would be. I would hope that uh, it would be understandable for Oak Bay to look at our fees and, and charges and make sure that our administrative costs are properly covered. Thank you. That's really helpful. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to go to Councillor Appleton next online. Councillor Appleton. No, thank you, Chair, and through you uh, to Mr. Bull. Mr. Bull, thank you for this, and I, I agree, uh, high time to be entertaining this. Um, I was wondering, I, I saw in the uh, in the proposed options for uh, delegated approvals that the um, that uh, Uplands Setting and Design was included in there, and I'm just wondering whether or not, I, I know that the Uplands Special Powers Act is a very uh, special animal and a very unique animal in terms of uh, bylaws of its type. And I'm just wondering, is there anything in the Upland Special Powers Act that would need to be considered when considering delegation? I think the, the Special Powers Act actually predates a lot of the current uh, specifications for, for development approvals that's, that's otherwise in uh, uh, provincial directives. So I'm just wondering, is there anything in there, or then you may not be able to answer that off the top of your head, but uh, do it, is there anything to consider there? Uh, thank you, Councillor Appleton. Uh, Director Bull. Yeah, through the Chair, um, that's something we would definitely check uh, uh, further into uh, at first glance. Uh, um, uh, it's one of the options that we think is available, um, but it's definitely a, a very sp particular type of approval. Um, that we would uh, need to make sure that if we introduce that, that it's properly um, worded, um, because it's, it's it's a bit of a different context than from the Local Government Act. This is a Special Powers Act from the 1930s that gave council uh, the ability to set rules and regulations. It, it doesn't say anything about staff delegation, so in that sense it's not excluded. But is it therefore included? I, I can tell that as for sure. I'm not a lawyer. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Anything else, Councillor Appleton? No, that's fine, Madam Chair. Thank you. You, uh, Councillor Smart, did I see your hand up? Yeah. Thank you. Through you, Acting Mayor, to Director Bull, I really appreciate this report. Um, it addresses the, you know, the true barrier um, uh, of the most costly element uh, for development, which is time. Um, fees are uh, fees are never discussed as barriers, but time of approvals is a big hurdle. So uh, in looking at this, I guess I wanted to ask the question um, in dealing with other municipalities with regards to delegated authority. It's been my experience typically that while well, you might deal with any member of planning staff, um, most municipalities, the sign off occurs always at the director of planning level. And I just wanted to know, would that be the default here or um, might other options also be considered? Thank you, and Director Bull. Yeah, through the chair, uh, let me see. Uh, it depends probably a little bit. It depends on what type of approval we're talking about. Um, um, I've seen examples where, for example, uh, environmental development permits uh, are reviewed by staff based on the development guidelines in the OCP. Uh, there is, 
of course, at the end of the day, the director of a department is always responsible. So in, in the example that I'm thinking of, it would, would be prepared by staff, reviewed by the director for sign-off, making sure that there's nothing uh, out of the ordinary there. Um, um, so I think it's, it fits in that context. Um, it, it depends also on the what kind of uh, expertise needed. Um, for example, if I'm thinking about um, uh, forming character permits for Lamy Housing is another community I worked for. It was delegated to staff. We we were f trying to uh, put one of the planners on on that type of review that had a uh, affinity with form and character and and design uh, and and the building officials were involved in that as well. By the way, because that also had to, had to do with the tight site planning um, that needed to take place. And instead of that sounds a bit vague. There were a lot of things to consider on a, on a small site like that. So building official input was there was very important. Anyways, um, making it too long, I think at the end of the day, the director needs to be comfortable that the decisions by staff are, are taken. And uh, yes, it's common practice that the director or deputy would review that. Thank you. Anything else, Councilor Smart? Uh, Mayor Murdoch, did you have anything? Uh, just for my uh, clarification here, uh, the process-wise, option one will move forward the bylaw, procedures bylaw, and and institute the fees and charges review. Is that is that correct? Uh, Director Bull. Is, is, if option one that that includes both the uh, the draft development applications procedures bylaw, which will go forward for approval, and draft fees and charges bylaw, which will be come back later after it's been reviewed. Is that correct? Um, for the chair, we would um, intend to bring both forward at the same time uh, because the current bylaw has the fees and charges. So we need to make sure that before we change the, or change over the bylaw that the, the fees are covered somehow. So it would be uh, simultaneously. Okay. Thank you. And, and then the other, just the um, the delegation uh, pieces of this, I can see pros and cons. Um, and just for my, my clarification, because what I understand of what's being proposed as possibilities are all considers it a minor variances is that is that true for things is that true for the permit side of things as well um, so would there be minor permits or there would just be would you would it be more blanket in the permit side of the of the delegation uh, director Bull. yeah in, in the um, examples that I'm familiar with um, usually they, they get the added word minor to indicate that there's a certain it's a different type of approval and usually it's based on the criteria that what makes it what makes a development permit a minor development permit. If it's not minor, uh, in other places that I worked for, it would go to council. So uh, no minor, minor variances are definitely something that needs to be selected and, and set up uh, as per your direction, so that we pinpoint what is considered minor in your, in your view and what does continue to come forward to you. Okay, that's, that's helpful for consideration of options here, thank you. Okay, uh, there's nobody in the, in the hall to speak. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, Councillor Watson. Yes, I do have a few questions. Thank you, Acting uh, Mayor, um, to, through to Director Bull. Um, uh, first of all, just thank you very much for bringing this forward. I do also pre really want to re really reiterate that great initiative. It's wonderful to see something that will clean up, streamline, and rationalize these processes. And I'm particularly happy to see the suggestion here that we would have uh, information meetings um, as part of the these development applications. That's been long sought after, I'm sure, uh, by community members and certainly a very good practice that, uh, you know, it'll be good for us to adopt if this does go forward. Um, I do, uh, just a que one question sort of following up on the mayor's uh, previous questions. In terms of the options you're suggesting, is it correct that I'm thinking that in this package in option one, we would also be supporting the, notific um, the delegation of notifications for uh, DVPs and sign signs as though, as though the, are those the two things in addition to the the bylaws th th that that we are agreeing to in that package with option one so it's the the mi the notifications and the signs okay I'm director bull yeah this, the sign requirements have been updated just across the board that's part of the and new of the, uh, the prescriptions draft, right? in the updated bylaw and and the bylaw does include um, delegation of the notification for development variance permits Right. So I just had a question. I mean, looking um, further into the future, if we got to the point where we were thinking about uh, any kind of delegation for DVPs or DPs, um, I, 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 I believe that any decision 
um, that m is taken by staff, a, a delegated staff member, is always subject uh, to uh, reconsideration by council. And I just wanted to know from your your planning experience in the province, how does that what actually happens in practice? Like, clearly, if an applicant gets the decision that they're looking for, there's no reconsideration. But to what extent do those whose applications are turned down by the delegated staff person then actually go to council and ask for a second set of eyes on it? So how, mu how, much, how much advantage is it actually in practice to delegate uh, in terms of saving time or moving processes along? So just, I'm asking, that's a very general high-level question. Uh, thank you, Director Bull. Yeah, through the chair, um, yeah, I, I do I do think for um, freestanding applications that uh, don't have other council approvals, it is a time saver, uh, provided there's enough staff and, and the timing, the process timelines are not lagging there, but uh, I'm thinking particularly about uh, environmental or uh, geotechnical hazard uh, development permits. I've worked in other communities where they were routinely viewed by staff, but those, exa for example, those reports uh, rely on a professional report, so the review of by the municipality is somewhat limited. So, definitely a time saver. In, in terms of uh, disputing any um, um, misgivings about a decision, um, yeah, uh, in my experience, uh, speaking for how I know most planners would approach it. If it's a delegated approval, you, you want to work with the applicant to, to see them to a successful decision. So there might be some back and forth and some revisions needed. And most applicants will be comfortable with that and it will, it will work out well. Uh, there's only one occasion that I know of from my own experience that somebody really opted to appeal or, or object to a decision um, by the planning director at that place and, and went through the effort of appealing to council and trying to make the case that uh, it should be approved. Uh, so it's always an option, but it's not commonly used. But the setting up a de delegated approval uh, does also require or is expected to set up that uh, appeal or reconsideration process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that's really helpful. So I guess I'm hearing that if there's a good kind of iterative, there's good professional staff working on these and good back and forward with the applicant, that delegation really is a time saver and can lead to really improved outcomes in terms of that um, to, uh, the times and approvals. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, now I'm going to go to the public. There's no public in the hall. There's no public on the um, on Zoom. So I'm coming back to this table and looking for a motion to receive, please. So moved, second. All in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. And now what is the will of council? Well, I'm happy to move option one. I think we're all easy, easy peasy on that one. So, okay, option so one. I have a mover and a seconder for option one. Any discussion? Seeing none, I will call the question. All in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. Option one carries. Is there anything else that we would like to look at, or we're going to move straight on to the next section? Uh, Councillor Smart. With this report in front of us, um, I think there's an um, expediency potentially to um, reviewing option two and three, so I would be happy um, to start by moving option two. Okay, and a seconder. Would you like to motivate uh, Councillor Smart? Yeah, um, with staff um, currently in this work mode, I think now would be the time to look and have further discussions about this, particularly with the review of minor variances. Some of these can happen during construction and to be able to shorten the, the time frame of uh, review for a minor variance um, can be really critical. Um, to have that happen under what could be a, a two to three week time schedule as opposed to um, what just wouldn't even be obtainable. Um, I could only fathom, I guess, uh, you know, months and months um, if it had to go to council. So I, I feel like this is a really important thing we should at least uh, look at and consider. Okay, thank you. Anybody else want to speak to this? Mayor Murdoch. Thank you. I'm supportive of the motion, but I had just a question on this. Uh, does, does in situations where minor variances are delegated to staff, does that essentially eliminate the board of variance, which is delegated for minor and hardship only considerations? Mr. Bull? 
Yeah, through the chair, I think for the particular options that are available through a, through a delegation bylaw, it would be the easier option. Um, that said, there is usually not just one thing going on this, on a given site, so uh, it would be common that if the site is more complex and it's, there's additional variances considered, applicants would still need to figure out if they are choosing the board variance route for consideration of their project or to come to you for a more substantial uh, customization of their site. So uh, that, that would be what I expect to see happen. Thank you. Mr. Green. Yes, just briefly, um, through you, Acting Mayor to Director Bull, um, just on Mayor Murdoch's point, so what you're saying is their role would in no way be, be, be impe impeded or diminished. Is, is that correct? Thank you. Yeah, generally that would be the case. Um, it would only be uh, if that specific, say there is a parking variance option. Um, if that specifically is arranged for the bylaw and that uh, can be done by staff, then yeah, that, that would not go to the Board of Variance anymore. Uh, but it's, it's a, not the right example. Um, we don't have a lot of Board of Variance applications, so I, I'm kind of lacking the background to say, to tell you what kind of applications do we see there. But from other places that I've worked, those those are more yeah, like, like I was saying, those are more odd uh, property uh, conditions or or somewhat complex proposals that people seek to uh, to um, to do. So yeah, generally no, this doesn't affect the board of variance scope. They have their own unique uh, set of uh, uh, applications to review. I appreciate that. Thanks so much, Miss Williams. Did you have something you wanted to add? Thank you. I think Director Bowl just uh, tidied it up towards the end where the Board of Variance really deals with issues where there's a hardship. So there's a minor variance, but there's a hardship related. So staff could look into uh, the, the, the feasibility of rolling hardship into the criteria. And at, at this point, we don't even know if that's something we could legally do and eliminate a, a Board of Variance. OK, thank you for that addition. OK, um, seeing no more conversation around this, I'm going to call a question on the motion for option two. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none, motion carries. Uh, I'll now move on to um, section number 6.4, which is the infill housing program project sign. Oh, sorry. All right, Councillor Smart. Um, I, I would also like to move option three um, for consideration. Uh, seconded. Okay, would you like to motivate, Councillor Smart? Um, we have this again. We have this project in front of us, and and staff has put a great deal of time towards it. This is simply a, a review of what would be possible, and I'm interested to see um, uh, what we would be what would be looking at um, with some more detail for that option. Okay, thank you, uh, Mayor Murdoch. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I th I think this has merit, but I I may be thinking of it in a slightly different way. So I'm just going to ask a, session, a question through you to staff as, as a okay, chair. Um, one, this has a fairly long list of things that were sort of excluded uh, and includes some pretty meaty stuff. And I'm just curious from staff's perspective, uh, is this, would they take this and look at all of that list in all its fullness or look at, again, kind of in the criteria that we were talking about, sort of, and, and what that might look like. And I, I'll just share with you personally, I think of all of them, most of them probably I wouldn't see applying often enough to make any meaningful impact, but um, minor heritage alteration permits uh, would speed up that process considerably, and that's uh, just a way of, of supporting heritage, uh, making that alteration permit process uh, simpler. And minor upland setting and design approvals, because we have things coming here where it's a siding change on a garage, and it just seems um, a lot of work and effort to go through a, a minor thing. So I'm very supportive of those uh, sort of minor pieces. But I don't know if I'd be supportive if this is looking at sort of the, the overall list on that. So maybe I'll just ask that question. This is a very convoluted question, but just to get some clarity of what uh, this motion actually means from as it goes and forward. So would that include like a, a staff time, et cetera, that would have to be put into this? Yeah, I'm trying yeah, to get okay. a sense of what, okay. the, what the scope of the staff yeah. time is. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Director Bull. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I think we would take the approach of looking at what is what type of applications do we see come forward, and um, yeah, what kind of 
needs or how easy would it be to set up a delegated approval that has, has clear criteria. Um, so, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily act on, on the whole list. That would be very uh, ambitious. Um, so uh, we would need to look at that further. So we haven't really delved too much into that. Um, there's also an opportunity to uh, look at, at those kind of uh, approvals later on when we do the other pr two projects related to process review and optimization. Um, but we can definitely uh, start that process by having a look if that's uh, if, if council is interested in that as well. Uh, Mayor Murdoch? Just, so just two quick questions. One, it, the confirmation that by passing this, it doesn't I interfere with the timelines of option one that would be coming back. This would be a separate consideration. It'll, it'll be done, that report will come back, but option one will move forward in a timely fashion. So just want to confirm that. Uh, and Seem nod, so yes. Okay, and two, um, just, an under just some understanding of this is being done from the sounds of it as a time available basis. This is not being treated as an urgent. I just want to make sure that we're all in the same clarity about that sort of time frame. Okay, Director Bull, yes, are you in agreement with that or? From a t I, I'm trying to get a sense of, of if, we, if we pass this uh, review of the delegated for development permits, you know, you, the way you spoke, it sounded like this would be looked at and come back with council, but the timelines of this might tie into some other projects. I just want to get a sense that we all understand this isn't coming back in the short term necessarily. It'll come back. Um, I just want to sure that's your understanding and that's the council's understanding as well so that we don't set undue expectations on this. Uh, Director Bull, yeah, because that, yeah. For, for the chair, um, uh, this is an interesting one for staff to look at because it's it's also uh, option two and three offer offer some important time savings uh, for a staff group that's very busy. So uh, um, even though we would bring the bylaw uh, back to you, the two bylaws separately in short order, um, uh, we would do our very best to try to come back on the other two items later this year as well, simply because it has a very uh, important uh, yeah, benefit for, for staff and, and, and for the applicants. Thank you. Does that answer your questions? Yes. yes. Uh, Councillor Green. Yes, thank you. <coughs> thank you. And through you to um, Director Bull, I'm very supportive of option three, but I guess my big question, I think others have touched on the issue, is about capacity and and the issues of, so w there are so many priorities coming out of the Housing Supply Act and the province right now small municipalities like this one, um, I would think our heads are spinning a bit, So, and we don't know yet what the, the housing targets are. So I just want to make sure that your department is in a position to be um, using its bench strength properly and, and, and that you've got the capacity you need to accomplish so much. There are such high expectations on housing right now, so um, that's my concern. But I, in principle, support option three, of course. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So yeah, I think it does go to a time um, capacity um, question on that. Um, Director Bull, do you have anything else to add? Or no, no. I appreciate the comments, and that's that's uh, a big unknown for all the work we're doing at the moment, where we don't quite know what uh, housing target order might entail. We don't quite know what um, what the full announcement might bring, and and all of those um, elements. Uh, yeah, we need to become more clear before it becomes clear what it means for the, the projects underway and the ones that we are starting up. Thank you. And I think that that's kind of, um, I mean, I agree, supportive of option three, but I worry that what happens if we go down that road and then it's all null and void because of what is directed to us from the province. So that, that's where I struggle with this. Um, Councillor um, Patterson, then Councillor Smart. Yes, thank you, Acting Mayor. Um, and I, too, am supportive of option three. I. I, I, um, I admire certainly, Mr. Bull, your, your desire to undertake all of this in quite rapid order. Um, it, it's, it's quite refreshing to, to see all the detail on this. Um, with option three, though, also, uh, just wondering about the sensitivity, because when we talk about the heritage alteration permits and upland siting and design approvals, we do have, um, we do have committees or commissions who also um, share in some of 
those roles at this present time and out of sensitivity to those bodies um, what explanation how, how would we approach this um, and what we are what we are seeking to um, optimize here and um, I think that they they will certainly uh, may perceive this as um, diminishing their roles if uh, depending on how it's presented to them. So uh, I'm wondering about the consideration that has been given to that. Thank you, uh, Director Bull. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Th through you, um, yeah, it depends a bit on which type of permit. Um, I can also see that um, um, some of those review roles could stay intact and would be actually be useful uh, input for, for staff review, right? Uh, for example, form a character. Um, it's helpful to have a panel of architects to to comment and, and point out things. So, um, um, so that's that's something to to further consider, depending on um, which type of variances we're looking at or which types of permits we deem to be delegated to staff. That would be part of a bigger review, and. Um, it it doesn't necessarily it definitely wouldn't eliminate those co the commissions and advisory bodies because they would still be looking at other applications or I would think in the case of development permits I would expect a lot of them or if not most of them will continue to come to you uh, depending on your level of ambition of course but uh, but it could also be a role uh, for them to uh, advise uh, to help staff review those applications thank you uh, thank you and Councillor Patterson yes thank you. Um, through you, Acting Mayor, and thank you for that explanation, um, Director Bull. I think that's helpful. Um, and just uh, just on that too, because if if in fact it changes those roles, then I, I I would expect it would also trigger amending the terms of reference for those those bodies. So it it's it could be a, somewhat of a continuous process of of work um, that is triggered here. So you know I. I, I know that it, it's great that we're moving ahead. I, I, I'm very supportive of seeing this work go ahead, but it does it's always seem like we do one thing and it, it just keeps on going down the chain. So I think it's important to think of those things. Thank you. Uh, Councillor um, Smart. Oh, thank you. Through you, um, Acting Chair, to Director Bull. I, I think we're all on the same page here in that we want to create capacity for the planning department and, and not add more onto that. And I guess that was my very reason for wanting to look at, at option three, potentially, if planning um, felt that they could consider it, which I gather from putting it on the report, there is a consideration for it. Um, perhaps, like what, I, what I'm hearing um, is that there might be not a comprehensive, but a few things that could be um, looked at here exactly from the perspective of creating more capacity in the planning department and reducing the number of reports that would need to happen. Um, and it, particularly, I guess, with, you know, um, committees and commissions, I actually saw some of this work as enhancing the role of, for instance, design panel, because it would, they would really end up potentially being the decision makers because it wouldn't be going to council. Um, so anyways, that's how I was looking at it. Uh, thank you. Okay, um, let's uh, finish the conversation here. And oh, you're, are you ready to call a question or do you need a comment, Councillor Green? <laughs> I just need to make two points and, and very quickly. Um, and they, they involve the use of volunteers and that is, that is part of our c community voice and input. So I think that's important too. Um, I think Councillor Patterson raises an important point. And my second point was um, the importance of, um, oh, I forgot the second point. Anyway, the first point is, um, I think, understandable. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I hope I didn't throw you off there. Um, OK, uh, let's call the question. Uh, Director Bull. Uh, sorry, Chair, if I may. I, I feel like maybe I should clarify a little bit what, what mm. I have in mind if I kind of um, ambitiously say I'll, I'll go back to you this year. Um, um, so yeah, option two, um, that, that one is the easier one because there are already some examples out there and it's it's very narrow. So you would come back, we would come back with something that sh uh, will say, 
uh, we deem this kind of a request uh, a minor one and these are the criteria that we would approve it all that's an easy one number three is quite a bit more involved uh, what we could bring back later this year is simply an initial exploration of options uh, but not a lot of detail and simply to have a further discussion with you to to uh, to gauge your interest in what exactly uh, we would further investigate so I just want, thought I would clarify that and, and not make it too big thank you Okay, uh, <laughs> Councillor Green. <laughs> Came back to me, sorry. Um, the other part is managing public expectations on all of this because it's th that's an important piece. So that's just um, a reminder, thank you. Thank you, and Councillor Watson. Uh, yes, thank you through you, um, Acting Chair to um, Acting Mayor actually the chair <laughs> to Director Bull. Um, I, just, I just wanted to follow up on Councillor Appleton's point that as part of that option three work, if we all now vote for that to go forward, I think probably finding out early on whether in fact we can delegate anything under the Upland Siting and Design Approvals because of that act would just be a, uh, that would be a very useful piece of work uh, because if we can't, then that certainly takes that off your future <laughs> work plan. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now I'm going to call the question on option three. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none, I'm assuming uh, Councillor Appleton is in favor. Um, and uh, that carries. And we will now move on to up 6.4, uh, the infill program, infill housing program pro project sign off. Uh, Mr. Bowl, again, it's free. After this, I think, Mr. Bowl. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Uh, another presentation, a little bit longer, unfortunately, but uh, it's an important topic. Uh, let me see. Yeah, the outline of the presentation, some background. I'm talking, uh, this is a project sign-off moment, so we're going to talk about uh, deliverables, uh, also a number of caveats, uh, what is not included in this current project outline, uh, discussing engagement options um, and council decision points throughout that process and finally service and financial applications. Um, starting with the background then, um, a little bit of a refresher of, of the infill housing project. Uh, we developed a strategy over the last two years, extensive community consultation, uh, lots of events and input and uh, these were some of the, these were the key outcomes so there are guiding principles in the in the strategy that were included and key directions. Those key directions, uh, um, excuse me, these are the guiding principles, I believe, to provide diverse housing options, support ease of implementation, and cherish what the community love. Those are three guiding principles that will inform the next steps. Um, infill housing options, maybe just to clarify what we're talking about, it has been a while. Um, but infill housing options are specifically and prom most prominently anything crowd oriented, so detached suites uh, of laneway houses or carriage houses are different names for the same thing. Duplexes, uh, triplexes, three units in a single family building, like building I should say. Uh, townhouses, still ground oriented, but merges, kind of straddles to multifamily development. Heritage conversion is another option that was considered last year and, and different types of lot subdivisions. Um, not on the slide, but also included in the strategy were a couple of other ideas around uh, different types of subdivisions and um, uh, smaller multifamily apartment buildings. But those were uh, deemed under additional options l last uh, last year. Um, sorry, I'm going a bit fast. Could you go back one, please? I, I think I covered those. Um, Yes, I covered those. So the next one, let me see if I missed any of them. Uh, multiplexes, which maybe would be uh, f three and up or four and up. Panhandle, lots of subdivisions. And, and additional or expansion of secondary suites into other types of buildings. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, next slide. Um, so yeah, we're continuing these efforts. So this is not a project that starts from scratch. That's a very important for the scope today. Um, uh, we also want to make sure that we draw conclusions from the pro process to date, and we create a program uh, for the community that does create ha additional housing options, or at least the, the pathway to, to uh, create a project. Uh, this is in response to changing housing needs and, uh, and to what uh, is now commonly referred to as a housing crisis. So the implementation plan is, is something referenced in the council motion uh, from back of September. This, this project plan 
intends to be that implementation plan or rather the project the, the infill housing program uh, project will result in the implementation of, of the concept so it's a final step it uh, will create program details for each housing type and it will also specify what kind of approval process will be followed for those types it is a council priority project um, or continues to be I should say it has a new number now and, and, and funding and and resourcing were confirmed in May uh, this this type of project does uh, require a consultant team uh, to support the district, uh, like like was the case last year. Uh, in the in the uh, plans, we also have significant staff involvement because it, we think it's really important, particularly at this stage in in the process, to make sure that the program is properly aligned with our processes, our practices, and the little things and uh, that are unique to Oak Bay. Um, there's also a number of rela related priority projects, um, <coughs> um, housing initiatives, uh, two projects combined, which have not started, are not starting this year yet, yet, but they're slated for next year, for a housing action plan and a rental housing strategy, and the two uh, new projects that also came up at the previous topic, um, but um, in the context of infill housing. Uh, th there may be relevant things down, uh, down the line uh, in, in the service optimization and process digitization project and the, and the response to provincial changes. Um, moving on to the section about deliverables. Uh, the first bit of the project includes a lot of analysis. Um, um, there's four elements there. The first one is approval process for each of the housing options. And there's kind of three pathways for that. The most straightforward one is making sure that the zoning bylaw has all the relevant regulations for a particular type, say a duplex, and, sim and people simply apply for a building permit, there's no council involvement. Uh, the next step up is a development permit for a more complex project, maybe there's a whole site that gets redeveloped, uh, that's a form of character development permit approval, for example, that, that will go to council or, or potentially could be delegated, depending on the scale. And then the third tier would be zoning bylaw amendment. Those would be for bigger projects, say townhouses or, or multi-lots next to each other with some kind of infill, or maybe an infill project that is doing something extraordinary that, that requires further review by council and the community particularly. The second element of analysis is housing options and neighborhoods. So we got a lot of com uh, community input last year. You might remember the survey for this project uh, receiving over 1,600 responses. Uh, which is a lot. Um, the way this survey was set up was really helpful with this amount of feedback because um, for each of the neighborhoods we have a good insight in what people in the neighborhood saw as preferences for their neighborhoods but also what the community at large felt was appropriate for for different neighborhoods. That needs to be looked at and uh, carefully and uh, needs to be included in the next steps. Um, so in terms of, uh, we also consider, of course, just our planners views on that and see what, what happens in other communities for different types of housing. Um, it will work with existing OCP land use designations, that's important to note, and, and the province, of course, any new requirements. Um, two other elements of analysis are identifying the changes for bylaws, and in our case, there's a couple of bylaws working together, and most prominently, I want to highlight zoning bylaw. Subdivision, subdivision bylaw is typically highlighted, but tree protection bylaw is also very important in our context, because um, um, with infill housing, we're looking at more pressure on a limited um, side area, and um, it will raise questions about how does it work under the tree protection bylaw, um, but there are other bylaws as well, parking facilities bylaws, and there may be others that we need to uh, look at. And finally, uh, reviewing the existing OCP development areas. Uh, there is an infill residential development permit area already in place. It hasn't been used uh, to date, uh, but that one needs to be looked at. It's, it's fairly short, but maybe there's additional detail and, and some further specifics that can be added there. And similarly, the multi-unit residential development permit area is relevant because some of the housing types uh, are probably better suited for that particular uh, DPA, as planners call it. Um, consultation then. Um, given that we're nearing the end of the project and we also uh, sized the budget for that, uh, for that reason, uh, previously, um, maybe a side note, um, um, the previous process costed about $130,000 to date. So that's where the, the, this upcoming 52000 is 
the next step. But we are hopeful that uh, given all that extensive process earlier, we can take all that input and focus on, on getting it uh, completed now. Uh, there will be um, a community consultation for a presentation and an event. Uh, we are seeking input through a survey. Uh, we, we we were really happy with the result last year of mailing invitations to every household and the uh, turnout that it uh, resulted in. So we'd like to do that again. It's not that expensive and uh, for a project of this magnitude, it's very worthwhile uh, to do. And of course, finally, or not finally, but th th that also would mean that we get new input and report back to you on that. Uh, council review. Um, there's a more detailed slide coming up with a couple of decision moments, but your role would be to um, uh, we would present our, our findings to you. Uh, council would uh, eventually decide on what kind of changes are made to the bylaws. And for the OCP and zoning bylaw, anticipating the zoning bylaw changes are substantial. A public hearing is recommended for, for those bylaw changes. Uh, Mr. Bull, can I just interject just for a moment? Oh, I just yes. need a, a motion to extend the meeting, please. So move for half an hour to 10, uh, 9.30. Okay, uh, second. Um, all in favor? Councillor Appleton, are you in favor? Yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Paul. Thank you, Chair. Um, another deliverable is to, to make sure that the, the program can be launched. launched. So uh, that involves procedures and making, sorry, brochures and uh, web pages uh, with information and, and, and making sure that staff understands the new program and, and whatever final changes might have been made and we're ready to uh, receive applicants. Then over to what is uh, excluded in the um, in the scope. Um, a couple of things we thought about, but um, for some of the reasons I just mentioned, uh, effort already spent and wanting to see the conclusion of the project and, and get the program in place. Uh, we did not include any additional rounds of consultation at this point. And the zoning ballot changes, even though uh, uh, there will be changes. They will be in the current framework of the zoning bylaw. So this is not a zoning bylaw review by any means. That it would be a whole different effort. Um, also, we're going to have a discussion uh, which which are the infill housing types that are included in this program, and there may be housing types that get parked for later and for a future further review. Um, design competitions. I, I just heard a very interesting presentation a couple of weeks ago from a community that used design competitions to come up with pre-approved plans for a type of infill housing program. Uh, unfortunately, that's also very involved and uh, that's not something uh, we can do at this stage, I think, and also uh, if the current um, constraints on our budget. Um, and then finally, uh, no change to OCP land use designation. So we're working with the current framework. We have established neighborhoods. We have the uplands area. We have multifamily and village area designations. And that's what we can work with uh, for the infill housing program. Um, also not included because we don't know yet. Uh, there they are again, the housing target order, changes to single family areas. Oh, and there's a word of caution that I needed to make. Um, because with the, through the infill housing, uh, project earlier, um, we, we did uh, talk about is the infrastructure of the community capable of, of uh, accommodating infill housing and, and, and what we have said before and that still stands is yes we can, we can handle an incremental infill housing development that over time uh, we'll see projects come on, st on stream but it's not a wholesale changeover of the town because that would be against one of our guiding principles. Now, we don't know how ambitious the province would like to make changes to single family areas if, if they make changes across the board that are basically become applicable throughout the province and including our district and it's a high number of units and it's allowed on every parcel. That changes the tables a bit because that means that now uh, we lost some of our control likely in that scenario, but it also means that the uptake would be much higher and much faster. Now that's a different story in terms of infrastructure impact because now you're talking about something that might have happened over several decades, might happen earlier. And even though that might be very good for the housing crisis, it does raise questions about can, can we, while we we're working on our renewal of infrastructure, is that fast enough and timely? Does it still line up or are we now creating new problems? So that's a something a uh, staff we wanted to erase in that context. Um, engagement options then, uh, another section of this presentation. So uh, I was talking about this before, we have lots to work with, um, but we will consult with the community on those uh, proposed program details. Um, the steps in, in community consultation, uh, today there is a decision point and that you're 
uh, I hope that you can indicate to me if that's the scope you, you want for consultation or any changes, of course. That next step would be to have that community presentation later in when the project gets underway, get survey input, stakeholder engagement, and circle back to you with the results. And also at that point, uh, you would confirm um, what kind of changes are we going to make at this stage, and, and finally, a public hearing. Um, advisory body is definitely important to uh, have their input for this process. So the, the three existing ones are listed here. Advisory Design Panel, Advisory Planning Commission, Heritage Commission. Communication tools then, uh, the usual ones I would almost say uh, are Connect Oak Bay website, but mainly for information and, and, and when promoting the survey, uh, public open house, stakeholder meetings, council meetings, advertising and brochures. And the council decision points for the process. Um, these are the decision points that are currently in the project. Um, sign off today of the project scope, so we can proceed with a request for proposals and mobilize the consultant. Um, the next step would be, uh, after all the analysis has been done and the program outline is known, we will report back to you and uh, outline those options and give you a final chance to, to uh, not a final chance, but an opportunity to weigh in what is, co what is sent out for consultation. If there's any elements in there that are either not ambitious enough or too ambitious, you have a chance to weigh in and say, well, we'd like this program to be subject to a community consultation. That would be... Uh, in month nine, sorry, six and seven, right? Yes, because month nine, that's about the bylaw amendment, so then we're a step further ahead, and 10, 11 is really to, to go through the bylaw amendment process itself. And then uh, some reflections on uh, service or on the financial implications of this project, and it's twofold, so, um, um, and the context is that we are expanding an existing service, which is the, the development review service, so to say, the service that we provide, uh, to the district and applicants of, of reviewing these applications. Um, infill housing options are, are even though there is an uh, OCP infill housing development permit area, the zoning bylaw doesn't really have the regulations for it, so we don't get these applications at the moment. Um, and this will be an added, added workload down the road. Um, we have tried to estimate it. It's hard because um, we don't know the details yet. We don't know what kind of uptake might might be, but this is a very rough estimate. And, and, and there's two kinds of implications, directly related to the project and later on. Directly related to the project is the budget, 52,500, and about 345 hours of staff time throughout different departments, which equals to about a 0.3 FTE. So it's a very substantial involvement on staff part. Uh, program related, and that's the future implications with new types of applications. There will be more uh, development and building permit applications in, in, on top of the existing applications load. Um, what's important for success, successful implementation is that we have people that can work for applicants, work through the steps. There will be questions. People will not initially not be familiar with the program. They will need to learn how, how to put together their applications. Um, in the way that, that is set up for Rock Bay. And another important thing there is that the cost recovery will take place for application fees, but it's going to be partial, so there's going to be a little bit of, uh, of demand there. For example, if applications don't proceed, there's usually has been quite some discussion about what you could do, couldn't do. Uh, so there's, there is, in short, there is implications there for, for the district budget down the road. Um, another follow-up or related estimate to this, we, we think that um, with what we know now, there would be anywhere between five to 20 projects, I think, that would come forward to you uh, for, for under this program or come forward to the district. And then depending on the scope, there may be small ones, there may be bigger ones. That's why the time range there, the second bullet is quite wide, 0 0.5. That's where I was thinking about duplexes and building permits. And, but five years, that would be for a, a larger project that needs to go through rezoning first and then separately for a building permit process that would take a bit longer than a, a single family context. Staff resources needed, as I mentioned, several departments are involved. Um, I wanted to highlight the parks and recreation and, uh, team, the parks team, uh, related to the tree protection bylaw, because that's one of the few groups like like my team that gets involved throughout the whole process, all the way to end of construction, because th that's the team that will provide early input at the idea stage, but is also involved while the construction is underway and there may be issues around tree protection. So I uh, just wanted to highlight that, so it's across different departments. And throughout those different departments, if you all add it up and try to attach numbers to it, 
uh, and, and assuming that every year we continue to get more applications, what you'll get is a pipeline of info projects at different stages of development. And of course, if you think about the timelines, that means in, in three years we could have that becomes 15, 15 to 60 projects that are somewhere in this pipeline. So that all adds up in, in terms of uh, staff needing to support those applicants. And that's um, an estimate, a very rough estimate this time, th at this time is two to three FTE is equivalent, but throughout different departments and teams. Then finally, recommendations and options. Uh, when we recommend that you approve the current project sign off. Uh, receive the report is there as well. You could also make changes. Um, given that there's a lot of elements that fit together, uh, we recommend that you identify the changes that you would like to see and then ask us to update the whole report uh, and come back at a separate uh, moment. Um, do we have other options here? No, that's it. So uh, and that closes uh, the end of my presentation. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you. That was a very robust presentation. Thank you very much. Um, okay, I'm going to bring it to this table. Um, if um, anyone from around this table have any questions for Director Bull, Mayor Murdoch. Just very quick. Um, for our, our comfort here, it looks like there's a, a series of stages in about six months or so. A fairly comprehensive report will come back to Council with looking at these. Uh, at, at that point, obviously, Council could determine whether or not there's anything specific that they want to direct in terms of change or scope. Um, but that would really be the first point that we would have that opportunity. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you. Thank and you. Oh, okay. And the other uh, uh, just observation in here on, on, on item five of the uh, project sign off document it just it has reviewed the existing infill residential and multi unit residential development permit areas in the official community plan. Where that doesn't actually exist. The infill residential. DPA, it's it, it, it cites, so I'm, I'm assuming that's referring to the, the language that exists in there about setting one up, not using it. I just that I'll, I'll just flag it that the language in here might be a little confusing for people reading it because it seems to, it, in first reading, I'm like, do we actually have one of those? And in fact, we don't, but I think what it was intended to refer to was the language around uh, infill residential development permit areas. So I just wanted to flag that for people in case they're looking at it, listening, uh, and wondering what that is. It's it's not actually done yet. It's just re referenced in the OCP, as far as I can tell. Is that correct, Mr. Bull? Mr. No, Director Bull. Um, Mr. Mayor, uh, through the chair, I would like to check. Um, I believe we do have a development area uh, identified. Um, but it's very, uh, it's general in nature, but it does, uh, let me see here. I'm going to try to pull it up here. Um, page 179. So under, yeah. yeah. So I believe we do have the, the we do have a development permit area in place. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my reading of it in, under H thirteen is that we we were to establish one, but not that it was actually completed yet. But anyway, that's fine as long as the language is not mixing it up too much. Yeah, um, through the chair, that's that's correct. Um, there are some uh, policies as well in the housing section that that. Uh, outline how it will be created. And that's a bit of a confusion, at least for, for current staff. I haven't really had a chance to maybe talk to previous staff about this, see how that came about. But it seems to, yeah, there seems to be two thoughts there. But on the face of it, though, there is a development permit area identified in the OCP. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'll go to Councillor Appleton next. Well, thank you, Chair, and through you to Mr. Bull. Um, Mr. Bull, is it, is it fair to say, and I, I'm asking this question mostly because I think it's a question that members of the public might be interested in, but um, is it uh, fair to say that sort of what is the, the, the practical considerations and the, and the actual defined elements that you're proposing to develop through this process, th these are things that we need or essentially are, are sort of fundamental to being able to respond to provincial direction on housing targets, like absent of some of these some of these tools and some of this structure we would have a more challenging time responding to the province once they uh, give us some parameters around their housing target is that is that your read of the situation uh, director Bull. yeah through the chair it's um let me see uh what i can say about it in in my view as staff view i guess um the infill housing program that the district already has been working on is is uh, going to result in a program that is very similar or it is along the same lines, I think, as the province is thinking when they were talking about uh, allowing more units on a single parcel. 
the difference, I think, is how in how the, the province has uh, signaled about it, uh, th but there's not a lot of detail yet, so we don't really know what it will look like. I, I think in our case, um, yeah, we've gathered a lot of thoughts and ideas for this. It is something that the community is really interested in, and I think this project scope is geared to that, to follow up on that input from last year, and, and to create a program that is 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 tailored to our, our community's needs. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else, Councillor Appleton? Uh, yeah, very quickly, Chair, through you. I just uh, I wanted to inquire with Mr. Bowl uh, to what extent sort of the current timeline that's laid out here and the current timing is is sort of rate limited. Um, we did talk through our the growing community fund allocations with uh, putting some funds forward to accelerate the uh, the village planning process. Um, and I'm just wondering whether or not this is the sort of thing that responds well to additional resources being added, as in like if it is in fact something that's responsive to the province's needs and, and their directives, um, whether or not we can secure some additional funding through that process to to accelerate this. So I'm just I'm just wondering to to what extent is this actually like from a practical perspective and from a, a staff perspective actually uh capable of being accelerated or is this on or there's certain steps that need to be taken here that just have to play out in the order that they're laid out uh, thank you and director bull yeah through the chair um, um definitely something we considered uh, while drafting this project charter um, um frankly i was hopeful i could do it we could do this faster um, um, but uh, looking at all the steps and the different things that do need to happen and, and also to follow up uh, thoroughly and, and on the process to date, uh, I do think we need that the time is needed and, and um, what would be helpful though, it may be helpful is if um, 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 yeah, I'm thinking out loud here, that's a dangerous thing to do on the microphone. Um, but yeah, the, the, the budget is definitely tight, so we need to, we'll need to see it through the RFP process, um, what kind of proposals we get and what the scope is. Um, and we are looking at uh, through different grant applications um, to see, um, um, but it's more broadly, we're, we're pursuing grant opportunities for for a broader perspective than just this particular project. But um, so uh, I don't think it, it would be realistic to do it do it much faster without losing quality of process. Um, and of course, uh, more funding is always easier, but that's uh, that's an obvious one. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, anything else, Councillor Appleton? Uh, yes, Chair, just really quickly, I have just a quick follow-up because that's a good segue. Um, I guess then can I confirm with Mr. Bull that um, given the existing laid out timeline here uh, and some council touch points that we w that Mr. Bull would come back to council if there was a risk of slippage, because I think everybody would like to see it done as fast as possible, but of course done well into the standard that Mr. Bull and his team have laid out here. Uh, but I guess my, then the con converse of what I just asked was, um, if we were looking at slippage, would council have a touch, pay a touch point to say, this is then we want to enhance or we want to try and find a way to support that? And Director Bull. Yeah, for the chair, uh, yeah, I think we have a, an option for that for any of our uh, pro priority projects. So if there are disruptions or, or, or obstacles, um, uh, we definitely will circle back to you. And then on this one, I know how, how prominent it is and how much um, um, called for. So uh, I'll keep it in mind. Thank you. Thank you. I think I saw Councillor Watson's hand up. Yep. You did, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Through you to Director Bull. Um, uh, thank you. It's so wonderful to see this in front of us tonight with the uh, deliverables, and you can see the extent of work that's required very clearly. And uh, so I'm just really, really excited to be moving this forward. Um, I do have um, a couple of questions. Um, one particularly is about scope, and it's really just a question of clarification. Um, it is not entirely clear to me, I know you're recommending to us that we stay within the scope that we've talked about, so certain things would be out of scope, and I, it's not clear to me that townhouses are actually within scope, because there seems to be some discrepancy between where they are mentioned in our OCP and where they are mentioned in the infill housing strategy. So I know they are not one of the items listed in our established neighbourhood designation as, a, as an infill housing type. 
and but I did want I really hoped that they would be considered as a, as a suitable form of infill in this project certainly uh, three townhouses on a property uh, they um, a triplex is not a defined term in our OCP a townhouse is and townhouses are associated with multi-unit residential uh, designation so I, I wanted to make sure that didn't escape us and we ended up not being able to include them as a, as a form that we would consider so that is just something for clarification uh, maybe you could comment on that thank you uh, director bull yeah for the chair um, we're going to pick back up where the strategy ended last year so uh, I'm looking at um, at uh, this is page 16 of the strategy that was developed last year and then for the established neighborhoods it does include townhouses um, uh, not for uplands um, but they're included in that category so they're separated from uh, the additional options which are um, actually they're in there as well are they wait a minute Oh no, this is the same one. There was another table I'm trying to find where we talked about the additional housing options. And um, let me see. Low-rise apartments are additional. Multiplex, four to eight units are additional options. Yeah, so they are included in short. Thank you. So townhouses for sure. That's great news because I, I wasn't clear about that. Um, and then I just had a comment about... Um, I, I, following up on uh, Councillor Appleton's questions about resources and uh, um, um, I, maybe additional funds to support the the um, the amount of work that is required, I did um, wonder in the list of deliverables. It's not there specifically, but I, it won't be the first time I've mentioned this here. But I am really hoping that when we go to the public, that we're not just giving them words and kind of. Um, um, fairly basic concepts that but we have some good visual representation of what we're talking about that they can respond to and I'm concerned that in the budget that we've got that that will not be possible uh, a picture and many pictures do speak a thousand words we're talking about changing the way our communities look and so being able to represent that in a way that people can actually respond to I think is very important so I, I just want to um, flag that for consideration certainly when you are sending out your uh, terms of reference um, um, f or an RFP I should say um, to get consultant responses for the next phase of work I'm not sure the budget would support that but if it doesn't I would like to suggest that it's added and that we do find additional funds to support that component of work so that we make this really meaningful and engaging for the community so that we get it right the first time and that is my just a comment you can respond if you want or not but <laughs> that's a concern of mine about that it's the only concern really I have about this work plan but I, I do want to flag it director will yeah, through the chair, um, I realized I didn't really cover it anywhere, um, but um, yeah, I definitely, um, I can see the relevance of it, but it also is um, in, the w in the category of more involved work, right, that um, uh, w would be hard to fit in, or, or maybe it's, it also depends on the approach of, of uh, any, any given consultant that would put forward a proposal. So uh, yeah, thanks for the comment. I, I will keep it in the back of my mind, I think, uh, unless there is a specific desire on all of council to, to maybe add it in in some shape or form. Um, um, thanks. I think so. I'll go to Councillor Patterson next, and then Councillor Green, then Smart. Thank you, Acting Mayor. Um, and just a, a bit of a follow-up on uh, Councillor Watson's comments, uh, last comment. I guess the my concern, too, would be um, it's fine to use visuals so that people can understand uh, what could potentially happen. However, the developer is, uh, it, the district is not the developer. And if, um, w so we have to be, I think, cognizant of managing expectations because if, if uh, we are conveying this is what it could look like, and in fact, it ends up looking quite different or many trees are lost or, or things like that happen, it, it can end up not looking anywhere close to um, what the first examples were. So I think we have to be careful about raising expectations. But um, certainly, uh, then I, th I think this is great, the report, but um, it 
there's quite a range it, when you when you say it's it, it the exact impact of the no new program cannot be detailed at this time but in fact we will need to set targets under what the what the province is is planning and housing supply they will be they will be um presenting us with with targets that we should consider i'm i'm sure and uh when i look at what happened with secondary suites which we undertook and there was a lot of public engagement on secondary suites and a lot of expectations on secondary suites um and the annual report shows we had four applications only and and then the for this year the budget projects only well eight to potentially 16 so that's that's quite far um, below and and yet that housing mix also needs to be brought in with this with the other infill housing in fact to um, to be able to gauge what we're accomplishing for for housing targets so you know it's not directly in this but I, I, I do think it is something that we in the overall scope of housing that we have to bring back into the conversation because I think that the expectations um, around the, co the um, council table and certainly within the community and what I was at least led to believe by consultants was we were to achieve much higher targets than, than what has been um, generated so far. So um, I just want to clarify that what has been accomplished will also be brought into the overall sco scope of the housing as we look at the infill housing too. Um, thank you. I think that was more of a comment, was it? Or would, would you like a response from? Yeah, I just, I just okay. want to confirm that when we get to the overall understanding what the impacts are that we are hoping to achieve, that it, it's not just infill, not just this part, it does include the, the part that we already completed, the secondary suites. Thank you, Director Bull. Uh, through the chair, um, yeah, my thoughts go to um, next year's project around housing and housing action planning. I think that that project would be a good opportunity to take a wider look at what else we can do and should do, consider doing in the district. Um, while also by that time, it's going to become more and more clear what is the uptake in secondary suites uh, um, uh, and in housing. So in that context, I. I, I I'm not sure if that's an answer to the question, but uh, that's where I could see us um, have the more uh, broad view of, of yeah, what kind of housing is, is being con constructed in, in the district, what kind of programs do we have in place, where else can we uh, take action to, to uh, create additional housing options. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and next I have my, uh, on my speaking list is Councillor Green. Thank you very much. And through you, um, Acting Mayor, to... Um, Director Bull, thank you very much for another very comprehensive report. Much appreciated. And one of the things that I have always favored and supported are duplexes. They offer a tremendous opportunity for maximizing options on corner lots. Um, they now could contain suites as well. Um, and I think we've all seen the treatment of, of duplexes in other communities as, as attractive um, and as very functional as well. Um, and that's one of the things that Oak Bay doesn't have is a duplex zone, so I'm hoping that will be in included. Um, there were a number of them built in the 40s and 50s, as we, as we know, and the last new one, and I think uh, Mayor Murdoch and I were on council at the time, uh, was um, a new duplex on Estevan, which has been a real gem and uh, you know a centerpiece for that part of the block. So they are a tremendous housing option, and I'm, hope, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing more of them in Oak Bay. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next, I have Councillor Smart. And just, uh, I'm going to have to ask for an extension for the meeting um, because it's gonna, we're going to run out of time in four minutes. So if anyone is interested in extending the meeting, please let me know now. Councillor Green. Can you use your microphone? Sorry. Yeah. Extend for 15 minutes. OK, do I have a seconder? Second. Any, uh, all in favor? Uh, Councillor Appleton, are you in favor? Yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Smart. Uh, thank you. Through you, Acting Mayor, 
um, to Director Bull. Uh, thank you for the uh, list of um, just relating, I guess, to scope of other bylaws that might be included as part of this project. And I just wanted to clarify um, in other bylaws, I would assume that that would include things like potentially updating the driveway and boulevard bylaws um, with regards to permeable area and, and, and things like that. You, Director Bull. Through the chair, yes, that's a great example of uh, a related bylaw. Thank you. Councillor Smart. Um, perhaps a big topic, but I wondered if you could just very briefly touch on where we're at with regards to the Uplands um, de de description in the OCP not relating to infill housing, because um, it's not doesn't appear to be listed as an established neighbourhood, um, yet our infill um, plans so far are recognizing that there likely will be some infill in the uplands. Can you just touch on, will there need to be an OCP um, amendment around um, uplands potentially um, permitting infill and, and how does that fit into the timeline of all of this? Yeah, through the chair, uh, yeah, I would anticipate some clarification and, and specification would be needed there. Right now, uh, Uplands has its own designation and probably would continue to have so. Uh, and there are certain provisions in there that are clearly aimed at, at, at preserving the character. Uh, at the same time, through the process to date, Uplands has been considered as well in, in its strategy document from last year. Townhouses and large lot subdivisions were excluded specifically from not being suitable for that area. But some of the other types are also considered or have been considered for that area, so triplexes, duplexes, detached suites and heritage conversion. So um, if, if that, uh, yeah, um, to make that part of an infill program, I, I would um, uh, expect that we take a look at that portion of the OCP as well to make sure it all works well together, there's no contradictions and there's clarity all around. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Smart. Um, thank you. So I got it sounds like that's all sort of interleaved into the process timeline wise. Um, so I guess my last question is just with regards to the uh, approval process timelines being half a year to five years. I was a little shocked by that number thinking that the success of this whole project is to reduce approval times. Um, could you give an example of what a five year approval process project might be? Thank you. Uh, correct, Director Bull. Uh, yeah, through the chair, um, uh, I would think, uh, say, there's a uh, four parcels that uh, either get townhouse or townhouse would be probably relatively simple. Who knows? But there was a complex project there. Maybe there's multiple independent um, houses that need to go through rezoning because that is a bigger scale uh, redevelopment of a neighborhood. Uh, the rezoning process would be longer. That's my anticipation. So the first two years of that process would be to go through that process of uh, zoning approval, getting getting uh, support from council and the community on that one. Then there's the building permit process. Um, it depends a bit how efficient everybody is lined up to, to move forward right away with the building permit drawings, but usually there's a bit of a lag time after approval that, that I've seen in other places where there is up to six months of, of coming up with the detailed uh, drawings for a building permit that needs to be reviewed. And, and then the construction starts on the way, but the construction uh, of our I, my comparison was, um, let me see, yeah, the construction process itself would take a while. And uh, depending on the type of construction, it might be faster, but if it's a multifamily uh, context, then it would uh, t take one to two years to complete the project. So that's how I, my top end ended at five years, and maybe that's a bit too pessimistic, but that's, uh, that's uh, how I uh, envision that, that kind of a scenario. Thank you. Yeah, and Councillor Smart again. Um, so just one small clarification on that. Um, so th that five-year timeline, sorry, did include the construction and, and not wasn't simply a five-year approval process? Yeah, th yeah, through the chair, yeah, thank you for uh, asking that question. That's exactly what I was talking about there. So all the way from start of ap development application to completion of the project being constructed and keys handed over. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next I have uh, Mayor Murdoch. Uh, thank you. Uh, have we had a chance for public input yet on this? Uh, we can go to public right now. Is there anybody waiting for public input? No. Okay. Back to Councillor Murdoch. Okay. Or, sorry, Mayor Murdoch. <laughs> uh, so if I might, I'll just going to move that the report be received. Should I move this? Thank you. Do I have a seconder? Uh, thank you. And all in favor? Any opposed? Not opposed? And thank I'm you. just going to move the recommendation here, and I'll speak to it. 
Do I have a seconder? Uh, thank you, Councillor Green. And go ahead, Mayor Murdoch. Yeah, thank you. And very briefly, I, I want to reiterate a couple of things I heard here. One, um, the budget that's in place here, the $52,000, I think it's important for us to, you know, to emphasize that the the timeliness of this project and the, and the doing it well is more important than that dollar amount. I think it came up in the budget discussion as well. Um, so if there's any impetus, you know, imp in impingements to that, the quality and the timing, then I think it, that should come back to this table, and I understand that it would. Um, so I, I just want to just reiterate, I think, the importance of that. Uh, I also think, uh, to Councillor uh, Smart's comments, I do think that in the consideration of the, of the design, I want to uh, emphasize that you know the efficiency of the building process, once we've approved a certain, you know, th this range, um, that should be a consideration of how we're designing the program as well, is how does it make it as efficient as possible, because that, again, has the highest impact on the cost of these projects and the most impact on affordability. So uh, those two, with those two comments, I'm very supportive of this, and I really appreciate the conversation we've had around the table. I think that we've kind of teased out some of the, the, the pieces of it, um, but it's hard not to be supportive of this moving forward and, and uh, hopefully seeing it's uh, its completion in, in reasonably short time frame. So, um, yeah, very supportive of this uh, motion going forward. Thank you. Um, actually, I do have one uh, question to Mr. Bull. Um, when you talked about the input from the other um, committees, like the advisory design panel and um, the heritage, etc., uh, was there ever any consideration? And I, I'm trying to remember when we had this conversation last whether we touched on this or not. But was there any um, because of your 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 comments on how parks, rec, and culture has been has to be involved for the whole process around um, around this housing? Uh, was there any consideration at, to have the parks, rec, and culture committee to be part of that? Um, at all, or was that just it wasn't because they were they don't really have anything to do with the land use per se? I'm just asking just because of the total tree bylaw thing that you brought up. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I have to admit I'm not entirely familiar with the scope of the, that committee, but I know they're not routinely involved in developments. Uh, if they were, um, if their scope extended to tree protection bylaw matters, that that could be. Uh, good grounds for it. And I don't think they do right now. I think they did before in their commission um, when they sat as a commission, but not now. Okay, is there any other conversation around this? We have a motion on the table. I'm going to call the question. All in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. So that motion carries. Thank you. Um, and from that, I think the next item is new business. Yes. Any new business? Seeing none, I would look for a motion to adjourn. Uh, so moved, seconded. All in favor? Thank you very much. And thanks, Mr. Bull. You had a very heavy night for you tonight. So thank you very much. And thank you to the rest of the staff. Thank you, Chair. Great job.